What's good, y'all? Welcome back to the Playmakers Corner Podcast. I'm one of your co-hosts for today, Simon Villanos, a.k.a. Coach V. And I'm your other co-host, Cody Stoffer. And this is episode 228. We are continuing our top five seniors position list here. And we're talking about offensive linemen here. Um, arguably the best I guess, players that Colorado has produced, at least in recent years, I would say. There's always going to be a couple guys uh, when it comes to these offensive linemen lists that are D1 but don't make our list, and that's just a testament to how deep this position is here in Colorado. Right, Cody? No, absolutely. It is, you know, like the most recruited position here, I'd say. I consistently see the most rated guys be linemen, whether that's interior or exterior but i definitely think that more tackles are are produced here and you know we've always had quite a few debates you know building these lists throughout these past few years yeah no for sure and i mean we have to be picky so we definitely nitpicked at a lot of these players already starting at five here uh just to you know find differences and you know be tough graders and whatnot and before we do hop into this, I do want to shout out Matt McChesney of 60 Academy Dungeon Family because we're going to mention him a lot. Uh, he trains a lot of these dudes, and so I'm just going to give him the credit right here, right now. Great trainer and whatnot. Uh, someone who's definitely changing Colorado for the better, has contributed a lot. No, we're not getting paid by him. This isn't an ad for 60. We just respect good football, you know? And yeah, I think we're just going to leave it at that before we talk about our process here. Uh, well, sorry, Cody, did you have anything you wanted to say about Matt and 6-0 before I talk about the process and all that great stuff? Look, you can't argue with results. And, you know, I would say over the years, I have definitely grown to be like, well, he is doing the most good as a solo, you know, outside enterprise as opposed to, you know, getting maybe pigeonholed into a coaching role and end up putting, you know, trying to get linemen coached up by, you know, uh, on the same staff as maybe an idiot offensive coordinator or head coach. So, you know, he's doing his thing and, you know, he's spreading out the talent as well. And you'll see that, you know, throughout this list and throughout any list that we talk about is that, you know, west, east, north, south, we got linemen here in the box state, baby. Yep, absolutely. So, a uh, shout out 60 Academy once again and Matt McChesney. He does great things up there. Really respect his craft and what he does for Colorado high school football. With that being said, let's go ahead and talk about our process here. And, you know, this process is basically what we do for all of our uh, top five lists, but we basically got 10 categories here. And each and in, in each category, you could get a grade one through ten. And so, just going through that real quick. If you get a grade one to three, that means you need improvement on that. That should be a priority for that uh, player because that's definitely a skill they could get benched for or lose their job for. If we give them a grade four to six, that skill is about average to us. Seven to eight, that's definitely above average. It's probably comparable to a two-star to low three-star talent, just to kind of gauge all that there. Eight to nine is good to great. Because Colorado has such great talent at line, honestly, a lot of these grades are going to be in the eight to nine range. That's just the level of talent we have here. And, and that skill, if we give you a grade... Um, anywhere between eight and nine, that's comparable to a three star, a high three star to four star type of talent there. And then anything from nine to 10, that's very good to elite. Yes, there are a number of nines for a number of these players here in their categories. Um, that skill is comparable to a four star to five star prospect they're one of the best in the country and there are some guys here who i feel like who are on that level so there you go um basically we give them a grade one through ten on each of those ten categories then we go ahead and add it up and that'll give you the grade that me and cody individually give players 
and then we go ahead and average that grade. So we go ahead and add that and uh, divide it by two in case some of y'all don't know what average means. And that <laughs> is basically the PMC, the Playmaker's Corner grade that we have given you because it's from both myself and Cody. And then we basically just rank players. Um, obviously, if you have a higher grade, then you're ranked higher. If you have a lower grade, then you are ranked lower. That's how that works. That's how these top fives work here. And like I said, we got really picky here. We looked at a lot of film, not just highlight reels, but whole game films. Uh, we've been, we've attended a number of games as well. I think there's only one player on this top five list who we didn't get to see play a game in person, but I got to see him at a combine still, so I know what kind of skills he has and all of that great stuff. But the rest of these players and a lot of the honorable mentions as well, we have seen live, not just this last season, but the previous season and potentially the season before as well if they played and if we were able to catch a live stream, um, depending on all that stuff. Stuff. And so a lot of work has kind of gone into that. Uh, we take opinions of coaches as well into consideration. But ultimately, I mean, we grade them individually and then we come together and we rank them. That's kind of how this thing works. Cody, is there anything I'm missing slash anything you want to add on to this process here? I just can't believe you accused our audience of potentially not knowing what an average is. <laughs> but. Well, we have comments that <laughs> tell us otherwise, so that's uh, why I'm saying it, just so you fools, you know, could learn see, something for part once. Part of me thinks that those comments come from the people that don't even listen to the episode, though. So, um, but anyways, <laughs> uh, no, I, I think that, you know, we've obviously reworked this a little bit, and, you know, we got a different set of eyes looking on this compared to last year. And, you know, I think that this revolving perspective that we've had has has been nice. And, you know, we've also gotten some, you know, words in from from live games. Like like Coach V said, we've seen all of these guys live and they did all impress us one way or another. But, you know, it's very cutthroat in this position. I'd uh, not maybe to the same extent just because this is consistently so strong. But, you know, in the same way that the averages really mattered and every category really mattered for those, you know, what that wide receiver group specifically and how loaded that was, you know, this was pretty close here in that, you know, one through seven categories here, or I guess I should say like, you know, the, the six or the four through six, four through seven kind of area was a little bit more mushed than, than some of the others here. So, you know, just saying that you know this is really talented you're gonna have guys that are going d1 that are maybe not on the inside but i don't think don't be worried about it because they're still gonna go d1 so there's obviously high upside here for for these players so yeah spoiler alert everyone on this list is d1 and there are honorable mentions who are d1 it's been like this Every year we've done this list, so whatever. You know, we left a Texas Tech commit out last year, so cry about it. But that's just how that works. Uh, also, I'm just going to go ahead and name the categories before we hop into this one first, just so that you have the categories in mind in the intro. But uh, our 10 categories when grading offensive tackles specifically is versatility. Uh, can they play multiple positions? Hand fighting, pass protection, run blocking, reaction time awareness, footwork, agility, strength, and size slash frame there. So we're considering both height and weight. Um, so yeah, there you go. Those are our categories. And then obviously we have our overall grade. But uh, without further or further ado here cody you mind if i talk about our number five offensive tackle here in the class of 2023 in colorado let it roll so let's go ahead and talk about it here at number five the fifth best offensive tackle here in the class of 23 in colorado is longmont's noah atherton uh, or atherton excuse me if i am saying that wrong and whatnot he's the 6'6 300 pound uh, left tackle for them he has been starting for a couple years i do want to shout out gideon he got to see him live against long or sorry he plays for longmont but he got to see them live against monarch 
I believe, uh, this season. And Cody, I believe you watched him play last season. Is that correct, Cody? Yeah, I actually got to see him in the playoffs against Dakota Ridge in that second round matchup. Boom. So there you go here. A very reliable left tackle. And so let's go ahead and hop into the grades here off the bat. I'm going to talk about all of them. Uh, talk high, low, highest grades and his lowest grades. And then I'll pass it on to Cody and we'll discuss him a little bit more as a prospect here. But versatility gave him an 8. Hand fighting 8.5. Pass protection 9. Run blocking 8.25. Reaction time 8.8. .8, awareness 9. Footwork 8.8. .8, agility is an 8. Uh, strength 9.1. Size 9.2. So let's go ahead and talk about uh, his highest grades first. So gave him a 9.2 for size and 9.1 for strength. Look, 6'6", 300 pounds. You can't teach it. You just can't. You know, that's pretty prototypical for tackles on the D1 level. I'm talking Power 5, Group of 5, uh, even FCS, you know, 6'6", 300. That is a really good frame. And honestly, he moves relatively well for that frame as well. So there you go. Strength gave him a 9.1. I mean, he's absolutely able to bully some guys over there at left tackle whether it's in the run game or in the pass game regardless he has some power there and he uses his frame really well now uh, another thing that is kind of up there another grade that's up there is pass protection and awareness uh look this was a kid that we honestly have seen play but going into this season we weren't sure if he was gonna make the list or not but you know he had a really good senior year and we're gonna give him credit there and he improved a lot his pass protection I mean it definitely improved along with his awareness he doesn't let a lot of guys pass him he's as reliable as a left tackle as you could want I mean he sets really well um, it's rare that he's beat off the edge he really knows you know his his uh spatial awareness uh really well i would say he has really good spatial awareness is what i'm trying to say doesn't overextend you know just really plays to his strengths there and i mean he's a big dude so it's hard for him to overextend anyways but like i said just really good in pass protection counters a lot of pass rush moves really well uh and that's what i really love about his game he's an excellent pass protector and there's no i mean there's honestly no surprise here that he played left tackle for the majority, I would say, of his high school career. And so really love to see that. Now, some of his lower grades gave him an 8 for agility uh, and an 8 for versatility. Agility, I think... Uh, this is like you know shorter space type of stuff obviously not top end speed uh, when it comes to agility he could probably move a little bit faster here uh he he could really work on that short space ability i mean he's not really asked to you know pull block or combo block too much here uh he's kind of just asked hey just block the guy in front of you on run plays and that works you know but also you could still move to the next level and i just kind of feel like he's not quite fast enough to take care of the first person in front of him and then move on to higher levels and keep up with the play is probably my biggest concern there so uh definitely something that he could work on there and that affects his run blocking for me as well he's not the strongest run blocker he does a good job like he's decent you know obviously he's a big dude so he's gonna go lay out some guy but I would really love to see him working to that next level that separates good linemen from great linemen you know working to that next level and I think athletically uh, he's not quite there to do that just yet I'm sure he's willing though uh, so there you go and then versatility versatility had to give him an eight here I don't really see this guy playing any other position but left tackle because uh, I don't think he's a strong enough blocker to really be effective at right tackle, at least right now. Obviously, any of these guys could improve. We're grading these players based off what we see them do, you know, um, this last season. And so just keep all that in mind. But just right now, uh, I'm just not quite sure if he could play right tackle. Because usually, I would say right tackles are better run blockers and whatnot. 
and I just, I just, it's just not quite there. You know, he's going to have to be developed a little bit more here uh, to really be able to play the right tackle position. And then looking on, I mean, you know, in the interior here, can he play guard or center? Maybe. But like I said, I feel like interior, I mean, interior linemen uh, and right tackles, those guys are very reliant. I mean, they're very much relied on when it comes to the run game. Uh, not as much as the left tackle, at least in my opinion. And I don't know if he's as strong of a run blocker as he is as he is a pass blocker. So there you go. Now, obviously, there are things that you could work on and develop. He could become a better run blocker. No schemes better. Uh, you know, really like you know work on his uh uh body as well and get it into the shape he needs to be to be a really good run blocker and whatnot as well but right now i think he's a solid to good run blocker and it's not bad but you know it's the little things that count when it comes to these top five lists especially here in colorado when it comes to linemen so there you go uh my overall grade for noah here was an 86 point six five here uh got real specific with it so there you go cody what are your grades for noah atherton out of longmont and what do you think of my analysis here this may be one of the prospects at least from a strength and areas of improvement standpoint that we are one of the most closely aligned on at least as far as what the biggest improvements yet to be are so you know there's that and, uh, you know, just kind of talking about the same things here. So I'm going to build off of where you left off here with those areas of improvement. Look, you know, I don't have, uh, well, I will say his lowest category for me is his agility at a 7.5. You know, I, I will say for Noah that he did take some pretty major strides from his junior year to his senior year. Because, you know, I like to see how they developed between, you know, that junior and senior season. And junior year he was i i had his agility at like a six six or six seven i have it at a 7.5 here he did take some nice steps forward he did get his feet moving a little bit better especially in space specifically and so you know you'll see his footwork be very solidly graded but i do think that speed wise and just athleticism wise there's still a little bit to to want there and I think you could see that, you know, in, in addition, you know, you kind of talked about his combo blocking, maybe needing some work and knowing when to peel off to that next guy. And that was one of the biggest notes that I had. And so that ended up being reflected in run blocking, which I had graded at a 7.8. And I mean, don't get me wrong. Sevens, these are still good. These are still two star quality grades here. But for Noah Atherton, they are his biggest focuses right now. So, you know, you have that kind of in that area here. But going forward here, talking about, let's just go through all the categories here. Now, kind of in the middle, I'm going to jumble it all up because that's how I roll. But, you know, versatility here, I have an 8.1. Hand fighting, I have it an 8.7. Pass pro, 8.9. Run blocking, 7.8. Reaction time, 9.3. Remember that one. Awareness, 7.8. Footwork, 8.7. Agility 7.5, strength 8.6, and size 8.9 here. You know, he's got, like Coach V said, that prototypical size. He's ready for that next level. He's got that strength. And, but I, I do want to say that I think that the most impressive thing that jumped off of his film and the reason that this category kind of became a thing, honestly, or at least why I spitballed or agreed with the idea is because of Noah, Noah Atherton here. He gets off the ball so fast. Like for for my Mario Kart players out there, my Mario Kart eSport athletes here, you know when you time that start just perfectly and it's it's that split second difference between, you know, doing the ah animation and then actually getting off of the go line perfect and crisp. Noah Atherton is that start time basically every time. I would watch his film over and over again, watching the same clip over and over again, because I'm like, is he committing a false start? Is he committing a false start? And I would watch it. I'd watch it slow. I'd slow it down. And no, he just is that quick off the line and that 
in tune with his quarterbacks, with the cadence and with the play to, you know, his reaction time allows him to beat a lot of defenders, beat a lot of blitzes, beat a lot of stunts because he's just so, he's so fast off the line. I actually think that, well, at least in my take here, I think that he has the best reaction time in this class of tackles here. So that goes a long way. And then pass pro wise, he's basically as reliable as it gets. And this is an offense, mind you, that had, you know, a record-esque year out of Keegan Patterson, who was one of our top quarterbacks last year. And this was an attack that spread the ball out, pushed the ball downfield. And so in order to do that, he did need time. And Noah Atherton consistently, consistently provided that and was just an, I could say, an anchor of a left tackle for this Longmont Trojan team. Now, you know, his versatility, I agree with Coach V. He's not a guard or a center, not now, and I don't even think I would want to do that. But, you know, there was a couple of times this year, a, a small handful of times this year, where he did flip sides. You know, maybe it was depending on the matchup or the play design. Or, you know, there are even a couple times where they line up with, like, a heavy line on one side. And so, you know, he'd be the furthest guy out on that and did a good job of sealing the edge. So I give him a little bit, you know, I mean, it's not that different from Coach V. I have an 8-1, Coach V has an 8. So, you know, but I do think that interior-wise would not would not recommend. Um, hand fighting here was another high category here at an 8-7. I think that he does a really good job. He's especially good at, like, slapping down arms, but also, you know, rips. He'll just push you into the ground. He'll, he'll let your rip ride straight into the dirt. So, you know, he's a traffic conductor with those hands. Uh, Footwork-wise, I think that his footwork benefits very highly from how solid he is in pass pro. He slides so well. And, yeah, I think that that is, you know, a huge component for his huge grade here. The only real difference here that we had is awareness. And I will say that the only reason that I think his awareness took such a big hit for me is just his vision downfield. I will say that awareness wise, he's great at, you know, reading the blitz. And so, you know, I think I could give him a little bit more benefit of the doubt there. But, you know, I do want him to improve his vision when blocking further down the field here, because I'd like to not only have to use him as, you know, a very strong anchor in my pass pro, but I'd love to, you know, I'd love for my left tackle to be able to help out on screen plays and be a bit more productive that way. And I think that awareness and vision is going to be huge for that. But I mean, look, he's strong. He's sound in pass pro, which honestly makes him a lot better than most raw prospects, just because you do have to be disciplined. You do have to be quick off the line. And Noah Atherton is both of those in pass pro. That makes my total grade 84.3. Coach V's total grade here an 86.65 for Noah Atherton's total grade here at an 85.475 here. A little bit of a wonky number here, but you know I think that that speaks volumes. Coach V, we got Noah Atherton rated as a three-star recruit. Would you say that he's going to a program worthy of a three-star recruit? Yeah, no, absolutely. He definitely is. Uh, going to a program worthy of a three-star guy. Uh, and I think his level of play really fits this level here in college. And so Noah Atherton is committed to South Dakota State. Yes, that is the defending national champs on the FCS level here. Uh, we definitely have had a couple guys who have went to South Dakota State, at least out of Colorado. Uh, first one that comes to mind is Bryce Johnson, who was a D1 level guy. That was someone that CSU let go, and then you know he went and just won a national championship with that, uh, with you know FCS South Dakota State. And if you remember, South Dakota State also uh, smashed CSU two years ago. Obviously, that coaching staff isn't there anymore, but. But just remember that. And so he's going to a great program here. Um, look, when I look at Noah Atherton, I really see a left tackle that you're going to probably have to develop here. I think as a pass blocker, you know, he's somebody that could get in there and be relatively okay 
you know, assuming that some of the looks on the next level are a little bit simpler, you're probably going to have to, you know, really go through the gauntlet with the film work and whatnot just because it's a different game on the next level, especially defenses on the next level. But I think the skill is definitely there. Uh, something I am worried about is just, you know, his run blocking. I think that's something that you definitely got to develop here. Uh, he's definitely a pass protector type of tackle that you are getting, that they are getting. Uh, it's still, though, a really good prospect because, you know, the FCS level, they got some ballers. You know, you still got to stop the pass rush to be successful in on any level of football. You have to have a good O-line and you have to have good tackles who could pass block. And so that's what matters. That's what we prioritize. That's what they prioritize. And so they're getting an absolute baller here. I think it's actually a really big steal as well. This is somebody who I feel like could really develop into a starting caliber left tackle for them. Probably not, you know, within the year or even two years of this recording, which, by the way, recording on January 17th, 2023. But, you know, after a redshirt year and maybe a year or two of sitting and learning, he could really be a quality guy on that next level and be a starter potentially for a very strong South Dakota State team who, like I said, are your defending national champions. Cody, uh, what do you think about this fit here for Noah Atherton? And what do you think about what I had to say about him as a prospect? Is that accurate in your mind? No, I agree that it's it's worth you know taking the time to invest into him from a film standpoint. But I think that one thing that's nice is he seems like a pretty smart dude. This is a 4.1 GPA kind of guy. He got looked at by, you know, I want to say, was it South Dakota Mines? Yeah, it was South Dakota Mines. So, you know... He's he's got a big brain on him, and I think that he's going to, you know, pick the game up quick. And then it's just a matter of working with him agility wise. But I mean, look, for look, for a championship level program here, you get somebody that is reliable. Okay, and like, you know, we talk about potential and we talk about ceiling we talk about floor here and the thing with noah atherton is i think that even if you can't see the highest ceiling his floor is still solid it's performable i believe i think that it is serviceable kind of like what you said that you know against simpler looks you can get in there and you know barring like i probably wouldn't like his odds on like a cornerback blitz right now as a true freshman but, you know, I do think that maybe he could ID it, you know, with some film work and, you know, communicate that, you know, maybe get the back to help pick up on that or something like that. So I, I think that Atherton's in a great spot. I think that, you know, this is what championship programs do, right, is, you know, they get they, they pick up on the solid players. They pick up on these guys that can perform. And, you know, for South Dakota State, they're going to get somebody that can help them be a conference and a national champion. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think this is a great ad here. Uh, he's someone that honestly potentially could have played the power five group of five level. But I think this is a really good fit uh, for his skill right now as a prospect. So, um, yeah, I mean, I'm excited to see another Colorado guy at South Dakota State here hopefully contribute to another national championship here in the next couple of seasons so we'll see about that but they're only, getting an absolute steal only here. after the Bears what, get what, one what was that <laughs> well let's not let's be real <laughs> let's not we don't need a we really don't need a sugarcoat it so that's okay <laughs> Um, hey, this was someone that was in Northern Colorado's backyard is all we're saying, but you know, it is what it is. You can't get them all, especially in Colorado. These type of players go quick. So boom, there you go there. Cody, is there anything else you have to say about Noah here? Uh, oh, shout out to his little brother, Ethan Atherton, who's a freshman offensive lineman who I believe got some really good snaps in. Might be a next level guy soon here. Just, you know, 
it, it's linemen. Uh, they it's a they're a really good lineman family here, and uh, you know it's it's in their blood. But uh, Cody, what do you think about all I had to say? Slash, is there anything else you want to add on before we move on to our next prospect here? I'm just really excited for his future, and uh, obviously wishing the best of luck. And Noah, along with all these other top five guys, please remember you are invited to do an interview with us here for an episode and we'd love to have you but yes our lineman episodes are arguably our best they're ones, the ones that i have the yeah, most go- fun doing doing the interviews with so they're they're usually pretty they have great yeah. personality we, we love our big guys up yeah. front come on no absolutely you know but uh go ahead and talk about the next guy up here at number four. yeah so at our number four spot here for offensive linemen is somebody who would also qualify for top five at another position, which he did commit to. But either way, he was going to make one of these lists here, and that is Russ Woodward out of Evergreen High School. And the former Cougar will take his talents to West Point to play for Army here. And so let's just go ahead and dive right into it. And look, I could call Russ the best two-way player in the state, and sleep just fine. Offensively, he's a fantastic athlete that has a nice slide, a nice kick step, and, you know, he's just very powerful at his size. Look, 6'7", 250 pounds, not the heaviest offensive tackle per se, but he is way more powerful than that 250-pound frame frame would have you believe. And so let's go ahead and jump into it right here and just kind of go down the line here. Look, Versatility, 8-6. Hand fighting, 8-5. Pass pro, 8-7. Run block, 8-6. Reaction time, 8-6. Awareness here at an 8-3. Footwork at a 7-9. Strength, no wait, that's agility. Agility at a 9.1. Strength at an 8.7. And size at a 7.8. Making for an 84.8 graded prospect here. And just as a reminder, you know, I had him graded at an 80.5 for edge and Simon had him graded at an 80. So no matter which way you chop it up, Russ Woodward should be a three star level prospect. You know, I had to bring that back up. But anyways, here, let's talk about Woodward, the offensive tackle here and the agility that I have rated very highly, you know. This athlete that we just talked about, you know, at the number five spot, maybe weren't, you know, maybe not the most agile guy in space. Russ Woodward is the exact opposite of that. He is a tenacious athlete that can change direction very quickly. He has very smooth hips and he just moves like a gazelle in a lineman frame, which is what makes him so, so dangerous as a offensive lineman here. Just the fact that he can move. He can get out of his stance very well. He gets upfield very quickly. And I think that, you know, he just does, I think he just does a really good job overall of moving. And so that allows this, you know, evergreen offense to do quite a bit here. You know, at least in regards to his run blocking here that I have graded at an 8.6. Because, you know, he can get downfield. He can pull from the tackle position. He can get across the field as well. For some of those, he's good on tosses. He's good on powers. He can pull inside. He can pull outside. It doesn't really matter because he's so athletic. You open up all these windows of opportunity here. Now, off the line, I think that he does a good job of getting off the line. That's why I have it graded at an 8.6 here. I think that he releases off the line very solidly here. And talking about some of the the other things that he does well. Look, his strength. Look, for being 250... Dude can really move people like he is just so powerful. Like he utilizes his frame, his core, his arms, his legs. You know, when he moves somebody, he moves them as an entire unit of a man here out of the uh, foothill mountain evergreen area here. So he's just very dominant. And, you know, even against, you know, some squads that did have some size on that 3A level, I'm looking at, you know, Roosevelt that has some dudes that are, fast or strong or i'm looking at northridge probably a little bit more that is a little bit beefy up front 
he was able to perform very well against the likes of those talents there he took care of business and this is while playing both sides of the ball so you know i think that's impressive and then you know his agility held up very well against the likes of roosevelt that has some really good speed rushers and whatnot on that championship level defense so he kept up with the best in 3a and before i already know people oh how are you gonna have a 3a you know d end up here well look he qualified for two lists so he's got to make one of them and he could do either on the next level so i just had to shout that out but regardless you know he just moves very well versatility wise his versatility grade definitely comes from i mean you know he did play both tackles a little bit way more left than right but he played up both tackles pretty well and then when you have somebody who is so dangerous on both sides of the ball that gives them the know-how on how to beat the opposing position in different ways and so you know i think that his hand fighting benefits quite a bit from that i have it rated at an 8.5 because you know he knows as a d end what hand moves work and so he knows as an offensive tackle how to combat those hand moves and either way he shoots his hands fast on both sides of the ball so i think that those are both solid now as far as areas of improvement here i look this is a little nitpicky here his awareness at an 8.3 he picks up blitz is good but he is he kind of gets blinders on when blocking downfield and you know sometimes he just he should sl he should slide off of guys but just doesn't he is kind of chasing pancakes a little bit sometimes and so you know while i think it is fun to put someone in the dirt like you're the undertaker it's also fun to block two or three guys on a play which with his agility is possible so you know that potential of that agility that ceiling of that agility definitely impacts the awareness a little bit here um but you know he does a good job of i guess of, like getting his head on a swivel now, footwork-wise, I have this rated at a 7.9. I think that he does a very good job. Like I said, he has a really nice slide. He has a nice kick step, so your pass pro footwork is good. But when driving a guy downfield, sometimes his feet can get crossed, and sometimes his base gets a little too wide. So I would say that consistency is, you know, number one on my priority list for footwork and whatnot. In the run game, probably more specifically. And then lastly... You know, his size, like I said, 250 pounds. That's definitely the lighter side of an offensive tackle here. But, you know, with his versatility, with his athleticism, you have the ability to kind of move him around on the offensive line, arguably. So, you know, those are all my takes on, on Russ Woodward here. Coach V, we got some similarities. We got some differences. Why don't you break down Russ Woodward, the Coach V style? Yeah, let's talk about it. So, Russ, uh, I think this is another guy who kind of, you know, uh, he was on our radar, but he really made it known this year. He improved a lot. You know, he hit a growth spurt. He got heavier, you know, and so he really improved a lot. I still think, uh, I mean, as a as a lineman prospect, he probably would have been a developmental guy. He is committed to play at Army on the other side of the ball. But, you know, there's a lot of things that transition and, you know, that could go both ways, just understanding the lineman position. But we're going to go ahead and talk about what I graded or how I graded him as a lineman and what I gave him here. And so just going down the line, gave him an 8.5 for versatility, hand fighting and pass protection. Uh, run blocking here. Let me make sure I highlight that. Run blocking gave him an 8.9 here. A uh, reaction time 8.6. Awareness 9. Footwork is an 8.5. Agility is a 9. Uh, strength 8.6. Size 8.5 for an overall grade of 86.6 for the 6'7", 250 pound prospect here out of Evergreen. Uh, let's start with the higher grades here. So awareness uh, and strength. I think that's agility. Yep, awareness and agility both gave him a nine here. He moves really well for his size. That's something that I really liked here. I mean, this was a guy that I believe played tight end at one point, and then he got kicked inside <laughs> and whatnot and played left tackle. And so he can move pretty well for somebody at his size. Uh, and, you know, we watched him at the Northridge game. We watched him at the Green Mountain game. And, you know... 
Those are both teams that are quality football programs. Green Mountain, I mean, they got some big boys up front. And, I mean, he really stood out because there's a lot of big bodies and they're clashing for a lot of that game. But what made the difference was that Russ here is just faster than a lot of those guys lined up in front of him. And so that was something that has always been noticeable. And also looking at game film from that Roosevelt game as well. I mean, Roosevelt, that's a pretty well-coached team. Um, they may not always have the you know the biggest lineman but they do have some pretty like relatively big dudes and some players who know how to use leverage really well here and so russ i mean he was just able to game wreck basically and he did his thing in that game too against the uh well now defending state champs and so those were all instances games where his agility was just very noticeable he's just able to you know just shut down whole offenses and defenses as as well uh, just by being able to get to spots before other dudes you know and then speaking of getting there before other guys there's awareness and so I gave him a nine here this is someone who has great spatial awareness he knows what the play um, well you know what the design of the play is who he needs to really block to spring certain guys loose and whatnot and you know evergreen they, they were a team that kind of ran the football a lot you know, I mean, obviously they passed it because they do have a good quarterback behind there in Tommy Poholsky. But, you know, they were a team that had to run the ball at times, uh, you know, for one reason or another. And so Russ here, I mean, he just did an excellent job, not only making sure he got his guy, but moving on to the next level, sealing guys off, you know, uh, in pass pro, he always did a good job, you know, just absolutely destroying one dude and then making sure he picks up the extra blitzer or blocking in a way that you know at least deters the blitzer just a little bit or at least he's an obstacle in that way i mean he's just a guy who definitely understands you know the game of football really well you know, I gotta give him a lot of credit there uh, to his IQ and some of the film work there. There's a reason why he is able to play both sides of the ball here and do it at a very high level. He just has a great understanding of it. Now, let's talk about some uh, areas of improvement here as a lineman prospect. So, I did give him the grade 8.5, which is his lowest grade for versatility, hand fighting, pass pro and size so let's talk about size here first i mean he's six seven two fifty if he was the play line he would obviously have to put on at least i'm saying at least 30 pounds i would say to really play on the d1 level and hold up well he is a pretty strong dude for his size so i'm gonna give him that credit but you know, if he was to play on the D1 level, he would definitely have to have put on weight. That's why his size is one of his lower grades here. I don't think there are many other guys uh, that are close here, uh, but there you go there. And then talking about versatility, hand fighting, and pass pro, I mean, he did play on the 3A level, and so there's just a different type of pass rusher and whatnot on that level not bad you're still gonna you know play some pretty solid teams uh with some big dudes who are strong and fast and all that great stuff you may not always find a team that has a pass rusher who could do both on the 3a level though uh doing both as in have great pass rushing moves uh utilizing both speed and power so there you go that was kind of hard to gauge uh not that the 3a level was bad at all but you know he was throwing around dudes uh, when he played Northridge, and I, I know a lot of those Northridge linemen, they're all kind of built the same at that rough 6'1 to 6'2, 230 to 250 pound type of build there. And he was able to kind of throw them around. And um, by the way, some of the people in the stands were reacting. They've never seen that before. And so that kind of kind of shows you where the 3A level is when it comes to those levels of pass rushing and so that's why i kind of had to give him a lower grade here um and pass pro he he's you could tell he's a little raw at times like he like almost like run blocks as if he's uh 
or sorry, he almost pass blocks like he's run blocking as and he's just trying to run dudes over, you know, uh, and pancake them almost all the time, which isn't bad. You know, that's still good. That's why it's still an 8.5, but it does leave holes open in the pass protection every now and then. So there you go. Hand fighting. I mean, not a lot of guys who have a big bag there. And then when it comes to versatility, I think his size kind of holds him back from truly being like a great versatile prospect but i mean he's still i mean if you were gonna get him at all line he's six seven two fifty really you would have to develop him either way whether you want him to play left tackle right tackle uh or into your interior which i don't think you would do that but either left tackle or right tackle you'd still have to develop him so it's not the worst thing so there you go but all together though still an 8.5 as your lowest grade is not bad at all that's still serviceable you know but you know going on to the next level he definitely would have been a project um just looking at Russ Woodward, though, as a prospect, to me, if he was to go play O-line on the next level, he'd be a great run blocking uh, tackle. That's how I kind of see him as a prospect. And then, you know, you see that he's a taller dude, moves well, 6'7", 250. You could really kind of just teach him the rest of the way and develop him the rest of the way into a really good uh pass blocker as well but definitely a bit of a brawler which you love and you know he would add some of a uh, uh, really good edge to your team and to your pass protection and offensive line in general and so that's the type of prospect russ woodward is definitely a brawler and a great run blocker um but you know he is going to play on the other side of the ball uh over at army but well first before we go into that cody what do you think about my evaluation here no i definitely think that well as far as project player at offensive tackle the size definitely is what makes that there however i i think that if he wasn't playing both sides of the ball i mean look you and i saw two evergreen games this year and russ is going 100 miles an hour on every single play no wonder he looked so lean. I mean, there is there is no time to hold weight, you know, this season for Evergreen, especially one that relied on great two-way athletes like Russ, like Jordan. And so, you know, Russ being that leader in that sense and just being the tenacious guy that he is and the passionate player that he is too. Because, I mean, we've seen him get frustrated and we've seen him take it out on, on a player. You know, if he gets mad on defense... Whoever has the ball in the next play, please don't run his way. He will lay you out. And, you know, on offense, when that push is needed, he is that guy to to provide that push. And, you know, you run his way, you're going to be in a lot better spot. So, you know, I think that obviously size-wise, he's not ideal as an offensive tackle prospect. But, you know, as a defensive end prospect, I really like this size for him, honestly. Especially, you know, at that height. And then, you know, if you are recruiting him as an offensive tackle, I'm not as worried about putting on the weight. I think that the weight is definitely there when he's not projected to be the workhorse two-way kind of guy that he is. So I think that, you know, looking at it from that way and then looking at some of the things that are raw, you know, I will say that his pass protection definitely does benefit a bit from the talent that he would face at times throughout the year. Because there were times where it was like, oh, you could just see on his film, oh, this dude's about to get clowned, right? But, you know, he does draw some tougher matchups in that Green Mountain game and whatnot that challenges him a little more. And so, you know, he could end up a little too under himself at times and in situations, right? So, you know, there's definitely consistency to gain as an offensive tackle for Russ Woodward. But, you know, if I were looking at him at this offensive line prospect and his athleticism is tantalizing for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And I think something that really goes a long way that's kind of hard to grade is just his aggression. You know, I think he has some of the best aggression uh, out of anybody on this list uh, and, you know, in the state as well. This is a guy that's going to be physical, that's going to be in your face. He's going to hit you and he's going to do it over and over again. And like you said, he's a high motor guy too. 
you know, and so the the battle never stops when it comes to Russ Woodward here, and he's going to punish you over and over again, and you're going to either have to deal with it or work around it. You know, teams found varying success, uh, you know, figuring it out one way or the other when it came to this kid and whatnot, and so uh, definitely somebody who's deserving of this number four spot here. I mean, this is a guy who, I mean, he's going to go to war and he's a pretty exceptional athlete at his size as well, which really makes him stand out compared to other prospects. So there you go. But let's go ahead and talk about his future here. So he did get a number of D1 offers. I know Eastern Washington was one. Uh, I want to say CU preferred walk gave on. him a PWO. But it wasn't Coach yeah. Prime. It was Doral. It was PWO so, from Doral. You know, yeah, so say what you want there. Uh, but he did get an offer by Army here. That's West Point. That's still D1. And, you know, he got to, um, you know, at least play on the side that he wanted to play. At least that's when we when we talked to him. He said he really wanted to play on this side of the football. And that's defense. And so he's being recruited as a defensive lineman by army here and honestly i love the fit i mean it's a great opportunity to go to a great school have a good future ahead of you you know play high level football as well i mean they're a d1 school army and so they're gonna play a lot of power five group of five teams and i think he's gonna be able to contribute there and honestly russ i mean it was kind of hard deciding where to evaluate him um cody talk you talked about it earlier here i mean we really considered him at edge rusher you know evaluating him there but we felt like he might potentially be a better o-line prospect and you know there are some guys we wanted to definitely include on that edge rusher list that would have been pushed out for sure because russ was basically a lock to make that list as well that's how great of a football player he is and so, you know, we had to pick our poison. And so because, you know, he committed to Army afterwards, uh, after that episode, this uh, happens you know, we got to evaluate him here time. at line. Yeah, it happens all the time. Regardless, I mean, he's a top five player at both positions, I would say. And you don't see that every day. Evergreen really had something special here with Russ Woodward. I'm just going to throw that out there. And, you know, he's improved a lot between his junior and senior year. This senior year was truly exceptional and uh, just very high-level football, right, Cody? Absolutely. I could I could talk about how great of a football player and athlete Russ Woodward is all day. Like I said, I could call him the best two-way player in the state and sleep just fine. And I think that his grades on both sides of the ball reflects that. And, you know, his consistency at both, like... Seriously, he would play every single snap in a game. Not to mention in his film, he also has special teams in there too. So, you know, and, uh, you know, he, he provides some blocks there. So, you know, I think that that's something that even as a defensive end, that might be something that Army would ask him to do is be one of those frontline guys and, you know, get lead blocks and help set that wedge or help lead that wedge i should say on special teams and that goes a long way too in recruitment and whatnot so i think that that definitely is you know an upside to russ and you know if they try and pull a surprise onside you have a former tight end up front i guess um but you know in all in all seriousness i definitely think that him being able to play defensive end had quite a sway for him because i know he was getting a handful of looks at a offensive tackle he told us that he likes to play defense more, but also he does have a higher tackle grade for us, both Coach V and myself, than he did at an edge grade, even though both of them were three-star quality. So I think that, you know, obviously the potential is there on both sides of the ball. I understand wanting to play defense instead of offense when it comes to specifically the trenches, but, you know, he's going to be he's going to be in the trenches for the Army here on the football field here and so you know i'm just very excited for him and glad that he got that he got those offers and you know is committed also just putting this out there it's not that he doesn't want to play offense he can and he's yeah, willing yeah, to let but me... we asked him 
you know, is there a side you would prefer potentially, you know, one or the other? Because we know he was getting looked at for both. And he said he would love to play defense, you know, just uh, causing havoc and all that stuff. And so that doesn't mean he could also, he wouldn't mind causing havoc on offense as well. He's open to playing both. So I just want to throw that out there before, you know, it gets twisted and they're like, oh, so you don't want to play just in case, you know, just for future reference. So, yeah. Is that fair, Cody? Yeah, I, I, I guess I should have clarified that. But, you know, it, I mean, absolutely. Look, he's he's willing to go where the football is. So and where they want him to do football things. And I think that that's all you could ask for out of a great football player. And, you know, that's I, yes. I don't think I could really add anything else onto Woodward here. No, I don't think so. I mean, he's a heck of a football player, man. Just dominant. That's all I could say. Just dominant, smart. He puts in a lot of work, real hardworking. And, uh, you know, PMC PMC fam for sure, real nice guy. So uh, definitely rooting for Army these next four or five years or whatever it is. Uh, So it should be a lot of fun. Well, it'll be four years because it's Army. Uh, Because I don't think they really redshirt over there. So... Yeah, but with that being said, let's go ahead and move on here, though. Uh, We'll move up a classification and talk about the number three offensive tackle here in Colorado in this senior class. And that is Jack Rons out of Dakota Ridge High School, the 6'4", 280-pound left tackle. He played left tackle for two years and right tackle for one. I believe that was his sophomore year, so he is a three-year varsity starter. Uh, I'm just going to go down the line talk about my grades here for Jack Rons here because I was really impressed um, just in general because I have seen this kid play. I saw him against Pueblo West, and Cody, I know you've seen Dakota Ridge a number of times, including, sorry, last year as well against rampart but uh man he killed rampart so everyone had a good game against one. rampart yeah Dang, so that's really like i said i don't even really count that one um and i don't care if i have beef with them i don't like their coach so let's go ahead and talk about the grades here versatility nine hand fighting 8.9 pass protection 9.1 Run blocking, 8.7. Reaction time, 8.9. Awareness, to me, is uh, a 9 here. Wait. Okay, yeah. Just making sure I was reading off the right thing here. Sorry. And then footwork, 8.6. Agility, 9.2. Strength, 8.6. For an overall grade of an 88.5 here. Um, We'll start with the higher grades per usual. So gave him a 9.2 for agility and a 9.1 for pass protection. Um, Agility, he moves probably the best and fastest out of all the tackles on this list and in the honorable mentions, in my opinion. He moves really well. For someone who's 6'4", 280, I know he is on the lighter side. He hasn't cracked 300 pounds, but he's in that 270, 280 range here. He moves extremely well, gets to the next level with a lot of ease. I know that was kind of a weakness uh, slash area of improvement with Noah Atherton here. But with Jack Rons, it's the absolute opposite here. I mean, he gets to the next level real easy because he can athletically. You know, it's just really smooth. He takes care of his guy and then just slides to the next guy, um, next defender there as a run blocker. And so uh, there you go there. Now, when it comes to pass protection, just watching him, I mean, this guy, he has some really good skills. Watching him counter pass rush moves on the 4A level, I would say there are a lot more uh, speed rusher type of pass rushers. And he just does such a good job. Just countering them, uh, sticking with them, staying in their way. I mean, he holds down that left side of this Dakota Ridge offensive line extremely well. Um, Watched a number of different games. Watched him against uh, Columbine, even though they only played one half. I wish they played a full game, but, you know, that was the lightning weekend where it was just crazy. But... You know, he held his own against Rocky Shields, who is a D1 guy, by the way. You know, and uh, against a pretty solid, you know, Columbine line. Now, 
can't really say that for the rest of the Dakota Ridge line in that game. And, you know, Columbine, they're a great defense in general. So, you know, it is what it is. But Jack Rons, he had some pretty good, uh, you know, highlights plays in that game, I would say, where I was like, man, he is just countering these pass rush moves well. He's not getting pushed back into uh, the quarterback, Blake Palladino. He's not getting speed rushed off the field at all. He's sticking right there with these fast guys. I mean, he is just a special type of athlete out there. And so absolutely love that. Uh, that's why his pass protection is so high here. Now, talking about some of his lower grades here. Size, 8.5 here. He is listed at 6'4", 280. Not only is that on the lighter side of things, uh, not as light as Russ Woodward, though. Still, though, still on the lighter side. He's not 300 pounds. But height, length-wise, he is 6'4". Everyone else on this list is at least 6'5". Um, and, you know, I'm sure there's some leeway there with 6'4", with that listing. And so, it is what it is. You know, that kind of holds him back just a little bit here if he was to play against longer taller pass rushers i feel like there might be a little bit more of an issue because of their reach and so that's kind of why uh, i have it graded there not bad though i mean if he is truly 6'4 280 that's fine definitely on the smaller end though and definitely someone that m you might have to kick inside but could still play you know uh a tackle or a guard but probably right tackle because that's the run dominant side in uh all that great stuff and not you know as much left tackle and so th those are my concerns i am concerned about his uh wingspan there and then strength i mean he's a pretty strong dude i mean still gave it an 8.6 but it's not exactly like he's bulldozing like a Chase Brackney or uh, some of those heavier defensive tackles. I mean, Dakota Ridge has a very, very interesting blocking scheme here, both in the run and the pass here. They pull a lot. There's a lot of moving pieces. And so it's not like he has to go up against a lot of interior linemen at all. Uh, really and so he's kind of like he's kind of schemed out of uh, those uh, stronger matchups I would say still though pretty solid and you know I'm also like he's only 270 280 if he was to be in the 300 pound range I think this grade would go up a lot higher and then footwork I did give him an 8.6 it's not super bad though uh, I really like his footwork in pass pro in the run game you know it, it could be a little bit more consistent, but I'm not mad at it. So there you go. But uh, definitely my biggest concerns about Jack Rons. He is a little bit smaller here, um, mostly in wingspan and weight here. So how is that going to translate onto the next level? Assuming he goes D1, who knows? Uh, but the top prospect, I mean, he's a really athletic, like tackle lineman guy uh, that you could move around. I think he could play right tackle and do a pretty solid job here. Uh, he could definitely kick inside and play. I think he's athletic enough. I think he's a good enough run blocker to do it. And on top of that, I mean, he's a real good pass blocker as well. And so you'd be getting a stud uh, pass blocker on the interior if you were to kick him inside, which I feel like might be the more natural fit for Jack Rounds. But he still holds his own pretty well as a smaller-ish left tackle. Smaller, he's 6'4", 280, but you know what I mean there. Uh, Cody, is that fair to say? And what do you think about my evaluation of this Dakota Ridge lineman? I mean, I think we're going to hear some similarities from my evaluation here. And look, something about his versatility that I kind of want to attest to as well, not only from what you see athletically, but Jack Rons has been getting in the rotation since his sophomore year. There, you know, he starts off at that right tackle position and in a postseason game is getting huge blocks downfield he's getting downfield and he's setting up you know these screen plays and he's utilizing that same athleticism but also that same initial off the line strength and that initial punch i think very very well as only a sophomore and then he just continues to refine and grow at these things over the next couple of years here and so you know i think that obviously he's 
you know, let, let, let me just go through my, my stats here and then we'll kind of chop it up. But versatility, 8.6. Versatility, 8.6. There it is. Hand fighting, 8.9. Pass pro, 8.3. Run block, 8.4. Reaction time, 8.7, one of his higher ones here. Awareness, 8.2. Footwork, 8.7. Agility, 8.7. Strength, 7.7. Seven, seven. Size, 7.7 seven, seven here. So I think that, you know, if it was just the weight at 280 or if it was just the height at 6'4", maybe his frame would be graded a little bit higher. But both those in conjunction to each other, you know, it just makes it a little tough. Like Coach V said, the arms and the reach and the wingspan might be a little bit of an issue here. And then strength-wise, I'm not saying that he's not strong. I'm just saying a lot of these guys that he is getting pancakes on are, you know, smaller edge, more linebacker on the next level kind of dudes. And so, you know, that just takes it down just a, just a hair there. And it's not like there's really a huge one where he's just another monster and him are just battling out like titans you know for a prolonged period of time you have some looks like that i would say on the bear creek film you know you get a couple of good looks against some very solidly sized you know edge rushers and backers trying to blitz and he picks them up and you know i think that's why his awareness partially is at an 8.2 but i think that his awareness could grow a little bit you know being one of his lower ones mm probably in the downfield estimation of angles and whatnot i think that sometimes he just gets a little fixated on one guy and he tries to chase him down across the entire field whereas he should just be looking for another guy a little bit and be not maybe like the decision on the awareness is what needs to grow but things that he does well look three of these are an 8.7 agility footwork and reaction time and i think that these are all very very well shown in you know his film as far as you know reacting to you know that initial blitz off the edge getting up getting off the line very quickly and you know getting hands up so i think that he does a good job at you know getting off the line i think that his footwork is pretty solid i can see an argument where you know his base can get a little too wide sometimes but I think most of the time he does a very good job of moving his feet. And I think something that's interesting about his footwork is it's so constant and consistent and, but it's adaptable too, in the sense where, you know, sometimes you do need to drive and you need that chop, chop, chop. But sometimes he does a really good job of moving his feet at the proper pace to just maintain his ground, especially in the pass game, because there are times where guys blitz him and he has the power to push them away from the line of scrimmage but you want to not you don't want to end up too far downfield and there's he has opportunities to do that against some of these edge rushers and he doesn't do that in the past game so i think that you know that's a huge testament to his footwork as well as you know his awareness i mean it's still at an 8.2 right at the end of the day so it's still solid awareness and it still gets kudos there a little bit and then you know strength wise or i mean agility wise a strength his agility being a strength of his i should say you know like Coach V said, his agility is what allows his versatility ceiling to be absolutely so high. And, you know, he's somebody I could definitely see being a D1 guard on the next level as well. So, got to agree with that. His agility moves very, very well. And, you know, I would say in general, this is a pretty good agile group of tackles. But I digress a little bit here. I'm going to talk about his hand fighting here. Look, Jack, he is able to combat quite a few different hand fighting attacks or moves here and you know i think that his speciality here is when defenders try and get those arms up they buy in way too much onto that lean onto that push trying to get that you know almost diagonal angle there and he just punches their arms down and they go into the dirt and then you know he just lays on them there and is like now think about what you did and i think that that is you know quite a strength and he's got a handful of moves and does a really good job of you know just getting that first punch getting that hand placement consistent and you know winning at the point of of hand fighting and really i think that you know he i'd say that you know maybe his vision could use the most amount of work i think that his strength i'm not really too concerned about it it just didn't jump out to me as much but, you know, I think that that's something that will grow once he gets to those facilities on on that next level. Coach V, am I wrong?
No, not at all. Uh, Jack Rons, I mean, he's a real athletic lineman here. I would say he's really somebody that you can move around uh, across the line, and I think we both agree on that. Uh, love his hand fighting, like you mentioned here. I mean, just watching these plays here, man, he hand fights really well, and he rarely loses. Like, he has the hand speed and power to really combat a lot of these edge rushers and whatnot. And, <clears throat> I mean, honestly, it's usually guys who should be faster than him, too. So, you know, just think about that. But, um, regardless, he is a big part of this Dakota Ridge offensive line, of this run game, of this offense, period. I mean, he's a big part of why this Dakota Ridge offense has been so explosive over the years, not just, you know, uh, I know they had a little bit of a down year this last year, but the last couple years specifically. So just throwing all that out there here uh, and whatnot. Now, Jack Rons, he has had a couple offers. Cody, I don't think he has committed yet, has he? No, it does not seem like it. But there are, you know, there are some that jump out here is, is one thing that I'd say here. I mean, obviously, you got Valpo. That is a Division One football team. That is FCS. You know what I'm saying? And then he also has a Sioux Falls, which takes me back to the uh, Jackson Muma days. Um, th that was an interesting one. But, you know, I I don't know if he's been re-offered by CSU Pueblo, but he originally was. So I would not be surprised if he does get re-offered. Fort Lewis so you know a lot of these you know D2 Colorado schools but Valpo look I think that you know that conference in general does a really good job that USD Valpo conference does a good job of finding some of these you know hidden gems and you know it's weird to think that he definitely gets overlooked I'd say because of you know his his height I would probably guess but there's just so much fundamentally solid stuff to work with here you know what i'm saying and so much power and so much speed that you don't typically see out of a tackle and honestly you know the game is changing a little bit year by year i mean don't get me wrong you still want your behemoths on the line and you know we will talk about a behemoth on this episode but you know with these with these edge rushers and how fast they're getting it doesn't hurt to have a faster, more agile guy on your roster like Jack Rons here. And who knows, maybe this Valpo offer is the first of a few FCS offers that we will see prior to signing day here. Yeah, no, for sure. This is definitely a prospect uh, whose recruitment might pick up here as signing day does come closer. I mean, he's a very... Like, just valuable prospect, very versatile guy. Uh, like I said, somebody who has shown that he could hold it down at left tackle, do his thing. Obviously, it's the high school level, but he still has the skill to hold it down, and I think that'll translate well to the next level. Um, like I said, most likely he's going to get kicked inside, or they're going to say, hey, go play right tackle, and I think he's going to do a really good job. Um, you know, look, this is just a very versatile athlete. Arguably one of the best athletes on this list. One of the best. And that's why he is on here. Uh, love that Valpo went ahead and offered him. That's a pretty solid program. Uh, FCS D1 program. But wouldn't be surprised if maybe a UNC comes calling or more FCS schools. I know Drake, you know, that's where his running back will be going to. Uh, that'd be an interesting thing to keep an eye on. I think on. they're in that same I'm sure they've seen too, him. aren't they? They are. They are. Um, or at least I believe they are. So, you know, we'll, we'll see. You know, we'll keep those doors open. Honestly, I think he's probably a group of five type of player fcs obviously you know but i i could see him playing on the group of five level not really tackle but i would definitely love to have him at guard and be really happy about him at guard um yeah Ma not an instant starter but you know someone you could develop because i don't think I, I don't know i just think if you're gonna play lineman on the d1 level you have to be at least 300 pounds uh, you don't really see too many, like, 
outstanding, I would say, players who are at the 280-pound, you know, uh, level here. They're at least 290, maybe even 300, usually 300. And so, uh, yeah, that's that's why I say I don't think he's an instant starter. But he definitely has the skills to be D1 group of five uh, at the very least. So, there you go. Uh, is that fair to say here, Cody? Yeah, I think that regardless of what position that you recruit Jack at, he's going to need a redshirt year. He's going to need to, you know, hit the weight room. He's going to need to hit the film room. And he's going to need to, you know, just develop, I think, as an overall prospect player, athletically, mentally, and everything. So I think that especially especially as a group of five school that you got to look at it as an investment where maybe you know there's a red shirt and maybe he doesn't get on the field those first two years but those next two years you have some you have somebody that you don't have to worry about and i could tell you from watching his development over these past three years with this very sound very solid dakota ridge coaching squad and assuming that a college a group of five college can match that growth and expansion of skill and potential i think that you know the future is really bright for jack ron's here and whatever program scoops him yeah no absolutely um and i i wouldn't even say you know he really came on his senior year he had two or three really good seasons like where he was a high level prospect he was out there he was doing his thing maybe he was a little underweight you know that might have been something that you know turned away coaches but he played at a really high level for a couple of seasons i would say uh at least compared to some of these other guys who really you know really peaked and had excellent senior seasons he's always been really reliable and there's a reason why he was a three-year starter and so uh there you go that's the standout player out of dakota ridge high school but uh cody if you don't have anything else to add do you want to talk about our number two guy here I would like to kick down the door on our number two guy here, the uh, su- the uh, micro celebrity on TikTok here, and that is the CSU Ram commit out of Valor Christian High School, Tanner Morley here, who, yeah, let's just kick down the door here for this six foot five, three hundred pound tackle who you know also played a lot of guard last year, started at guard last year. And I think that that's a great place to start for his highest rated strength here and the highest rating out of any player on this list at a 9.3 in versatility. Look, I said the most versatile guy on this list. He showed D1 potential as a guard and then doubled down as a tackle this year with both years easily warranting D1 attention here. And with that in mind, let's go ahead and climb down the rest of this list and talk about some of these other strengths. But, you know, and speaking of strength, that is his second highest rated category here for me at a nine here. Look, dude's a bully. All right. And, you know, I think that he's just nasty down low. He does a great job of getting leverage and then just putting whatever defender it is into an actual nightmare scenario, collecting pancakes and, you know, dishing them out nice and solid like you know it's like he's working at the international house when when he's serving up these pancakes and i think that you know not only is he very strong but i think that he utilizes that strength very well and is also just a very smart lineman here because the thing is that you know and he's conquered many of of the strongest players in this state here right But I think that's something that makes him so dangerous as a run blocker and something that just shows me a lot of potential here is, you know, he's very smart when sliding off of, you know, when when he combos and then escalates to the next level, he knows when to drive the guy and then he knows when to peel off to another one. And I feel like that's something that a lot of these players struggle with. And so to see Tanner Morley do such a good job on that is very good. He's somebody who has pulled from the guard position, both inside and outside. He's somebody who's pulled from the tackle position, both inside and outside, and has done a good job on toss plays and everything like that. So his run blocking is at an 8.7 for me. I think that he's a proven run blocker, 
And, you know, part of that definitely comes from his strength and whatnot. But, you know, his run blocking in pass pro, I think that he's very solid at both of these things. I actually have both of these rated at an overall 8.7 here. I think that he does a great job of, you know, getting a solid kick step. And, you know, he's proved it. And he's gotten some pretty good tests here, especially because the last two years of his high school career, his final game of the season, both junior and senior year, was against Cherry Creek, where, you know, he does pull the toughest. Well, I'd say from a overall lineman perspective, you're going to pull the toughest assignments against Cherry Creek specifically. And, you know, our top five edge list has a lot to say about that. So please go check that out. But, you know, he rises to the occasion at times and he makes plays. He's made blocks on the likes of a Chase Brackney, on the likes of a Blake Purchase. You know, last year, obviously, having some of those same kind of matchups with a Zelinskis or with a Fitzpatrick at times. And, you know, Fitzpatrick had a good game, but, you know, he didn't win every single snap. And Tanner Morley is partially to thank for that. And, you know, something those tests definitely pushed him as a player and as a prospect here. You know, his size, 6'5", 300 pounds. I give that an 8.9. I don't really think there's really that much else to add on to it. And, um, you know, advancing forward. Look, his other categories here that aren't quite in the green but aren't quite in the red are an 8.7 for both agility and awareness. I think, obviously, you know, he picks up blitzes. He acknowledges guys very well. He reacts to stunts very, very well, both as a guard and as a tackle so, you know, those are both really good. I think that he does a good job as well of communicating that to his other linemen. I think that specifically in his guard film, you see him talking a lot to his tackle, to his center, getting guys ID'd, pointing them out. And, you know, that shows me a lot awareness-wise and just IQ-wise as a football player. And that, in turn, makes his run blocking an 8.7 and his pass pro an 8.7 and stuff like that. Furthermore, you know, his agility, he's surprisingly athletic honestly i was not expecting him to operate in space as well as he does in both his game film both in real life as well as you know in his highlights and whatnot but he does a really good job and he was asked to do kind of a lot here not only transitioning from guard to tackle but this mcgatlin offense is kind of a crazy offense to run you have a lot of misdirection you have a lot of and you know McGatlin asks the most out of his best offensive linemen. And I think that's why Tanner Morley was asked to do so much and why, you know, he did rise to the occasion. I think that, you know, this McGatlin hire, you know, say what you want. Oh, same result. But no, I think this McGatlin hire was very critical for Morley's development as both a prospect and just as an IQ kind of guy. And I think that he rose to the occasion. I think he really did rise to the occasion very, very well. Now, as far as things that could use some improvement, these still have good grades, but I would just like to see some growth out of this. Reaction time-wise, I wouldn't even say he's the fastest guy off of his own offensive line, which they're not like, it's not like last year, I'd say. We're like, okay, you know, Jake, Michael, uh, maybe you have a little bit more of a reason there. But I, I do think that he could just shoot off a little bit faster. I mean, it's still at an 8.4, but... You know, I think that that's that's all right. And, you know, it, it is what it is to some extent. But and then, you know, obviously, when he was tested against the best in the state, there were times where he did lose. And that's a little bit on reaction time. And I think it's also equally on hand fighting that I have rated out at 8.4. Like his hand fighting holds up very well against most. But, you know, he did prove vulnerable or maybe tried to use hand fighting when it wasn't the move. There is one play this year where, you know, he's strong, his strength is rated out of nine, but, you know, against the likes of Brett Alvey, who, don't get me wrong, is a dog, and, you know, is one of, one of if not the strongest player scale, like, pound for pound wise in the state, um, you know, where he maybe tries to go for a push, and Alvey just runs through it, you know what I mean, and so, I think that his hand fighting both needs a little bit of work on you know the speed part but maybe also the utilization part and how exactly he goes about hand fighting and so i think that you know shooting that out and getting the hand fighting up is kind of hand in hand no pun actually that was definitely pun intended i'm not gonna lie to you but you know it's definitely something to consider when developing tanner morley as a prospect here coach v i've yammered on for quite a bit here but you have some you have high praise for for morley here as well I really want to talk about his TikTok. 
But let's <laughs> here. Let's let's get to the football okay, first. Football first. But... Uh, you know, I love it too. Yeah, he, you know? he's so a let, whole personality for game. sure. We'll, we'll get to that. Yeah. yeah. So you you've seen him play against Chair Creek twice. And obviously, I mean, he's not doing horrible enough to get pinched. Uh, and, and even Regis this, I think even this year, as well, I mean, just a, that has a solid defensive line. I'll add. Wait, what? I also got to see him against Regis live this year that had a very solid yes. defensive line performance in general in that game. Yes, that's right. And I was not able to go to that game because, well, it was freezing. Um, or sorry, no, that not that first game. I was not able to go to that first game because I was in Pueblo. But I did get to see the playoff game against Regis, and that game was freezing. Like, a game... Uh, Every game in Colorado got canceled except for that one and another playoff game up north, which was even worse. And so I, but I was still able to watch that one. And then I've been able to see Morley play here against, uh, shoot, why am I blanking? Against, sorry, against Thunder Ridge, who always has a pretty good defense, has a great front seven, uh, led by Caden Schaus, who is our number three edge rusher. Just throwing that out there. You know, and so Morley, and he moves around on the offensive line, and that's something I really love about his game. But um, let's just go down the line grade wise, and then we'll talk about more of that stuff later here, though. Versatility gave him a 9. Hand fighting 8.3. Pass uh, protection 8.8. Run blocking 8.75. It is definitely up there. Uh, I think he's the second best run blocker on this list just barely reaction time 8.5 awareness 9 footwork 8.8 agility is an 8.4 then strength and size are both a 9 for an 87.5 5 here for tanner morley here um talking about things i really like versatility look i gotta give him a lot of credit because he played on the interior for pretty i want to say pretty much his entire career until his senior year and they that's when they asked him to play tackle you know and you know they moved him to left tackle right tackle it kind of just depended on the play uh to be honest with you and the game as well uh looking through the number of games that he played they it kind of really seems like they moved him around when, and that's hard you know it's not easy playing left tackle and right tackle in the same game or even the same season because they're just things that you know you kind of got to tell your brain to do differently it's different sides of the field different ways to get leverage stuff like that it's really hard honestly and so that's why his versatility is so high this is a guy who i legitimately i can't talk who i legitimately think could play all five positions on the offensive line on the next level, on the D1 level here. I really think that. And so just being able to see him dominate and play so well across the board, you know, um, against really good defenses. Cody, like you said, Cherry Creek, I really looked into those games. And then I also saw him against Thunder Ridge where he did a really good job. Uh, was really impressive. Oh, and Regis Jesuit as well. But it was really impressive, you know, just seeing him being a being moved around and just dominate dominating no matter where he's at you know that's really hard to do you have to be a special type of lineman to do that and that's why he is up here honestly um and like i said this is a guy who played tackle for the first time i'm pretty sure his senior year and so that is big time so there you go nine at versatility that is the highest grade outside of jack ron's i would probably say here uh for versatility on this list um, Jack has a nine as well. So Tanner actually should be a little bit higher, but anyways, strength and size, both a nine. I mean, six, five, 300. That's pretty prototypical for tackle guard, whatever. That's about the perfect size and frame to be honest with you. Uh, strength. I mean, like I said, he held up really well, saw some of those snaps against Chase Brackney, who is one of uh, probably the best power rusher in the entire state loved uh, that he was able to hold his own there, uh, did a good job there. And then, uh, you know, against Thunder Ridge, he did his thing, uh, Regis as well. And so, love all of that. Now, some of his lower grades, uh, hand fighting agility. Cody, you talked about this. I think uh, hand fighting, I kind of... I feel like some of that just comes from inexperience playing tackle. You know, it's not 
easy just you know going from interior lineman to tackle it's really not you know and then moving getting moved around from left to right like it, it gets it gets to be kind of a lot honestly it gets to be a little extra and I don't blame McGatlin. I love the guy, uh, at, well, as a person and as a coach. But it's really a lot to ask out of a lineman on any level. And so I'm going to kind of give him a little bit of a pass there. That's not to say, you know, he can't improve at all. He definitely can, you know. Uh, but I think if he is to play tackle on the next level, it's going to need some improvement. And I think that's just going to come with experience. And so not much you could really do about that right now. Um, but it's something that you got to kind of prioritize, in my opinion. And agility, it's not bad. I gave him an 8.4. That's still three-star level. Uh, he moves relatively well for someone at his size. He could probably move a little bit better, you know, lean up just a little bit here. And I think that'll, I mean, that'll be fine, but I'm not super worried about it. Still, though, you know, I think those are probably some of the weaker links in his game. Altogether, though, Tanner Morley is an extremely versatile lineman, the most versatile lineman on this list, probably right next to Jack Ron's, in my opinion. Uh, someone who can play on the D1 level, compete at all five positions, potentially play all five positions i mean if you are a coach getting this kid you can feel pretty good that you're getting someone that you know who you know you don't know if he's gonna start right away but if one of your guys goes down he can almost be a plug and play guy and do relatively well and so uh this is an absolute get here and I, he's a lot of coaches' dreams, to be honest with you, because he just knows the game so well that he's able to play at each position. Uh, a very good all-around player and whatnot. And a big part of this Valor Christian offense and team, I mean, this was a team that did go to state a couple years in a row and had a pretty good run games. And, you know, when they chose to pass it, he gave them clean pockets, you know. Um, now can't talk much about you know scheming past games and whatnot but at least as a pass blocker he did really well so just throwing all that out there so there you go there now before we talk about his commitment which he committed before the season so most of you should know i do want to talk about his tiktok page here because obviously he has his personal at tyler tanner dot morley um go ahead and give him a follow hopefully we're tagging him in our tiktoks we should be so you know you can follow him through that as well uh check out our tiktok at playmakers corner by the way but he also has another tiktok which is not football related but it's called tub eats at tub eats you know where he has 32.9k followers and he's basically a food critic he just goes to places and he, I mean, you know, it's pretty self-explanatory. There you go. And he's he has so had some funny, celebrities. <laughs> no, he's hilarious. He's hilarious. I love the kid. You know, he's a real good guy. Um, real funny, dude. And I know uh, Isaac Cooch, Isaac Rochelle, <laughs> commented on one of his TikToks, which was pretty hype. You know, he's a little... NFL influencer there as well, who also plays line, not offensive line though. And so, you know, he's, he's pretty TikTok famous, but I am going to throw this out there because this just shows, you know, this, this, this shows social media and in our culture in general. But when you look up Tub Eats, so just type in Tub Eats, right? In the TikTok search engine, here are the first things that come up. And I, I didn't follow him in, until tonight, the 17th. So just throwing this out there. It's not stuff that I searched up. But obviously, the first thing is Tub Eats. After that, it's Tub Eats football height. Then the next three are Tub Eats gets tossed football. Tub Eats gets thrown. <laughs> uh, tub Eats height. Uh, tub Eats cameraman. And then there's a Tub Eats uh, punter and Tub Eats CSU. So to all you haters out there and, you know... I, I can't say we're innocent either, but we hate it on the program, not the player, just throwing that out there. He's an excellent player. That's why he's number two on this list. Also, Valor offensive linemen usually do well on our top fives. I'm pretty sure we've had one, I want to say every year so far, and so he just kind of continues that uh, tradition. But just throwing all that out there, you know, the haters, they, they definitely hate bro. <laughs> just a little bit but you know every great player 
and every influencer has those people isn't that right cody speaking from personal experience <laughs> a little bit yeah but i mean oh my gosh i, I love the content also <laughs> if i could i i don't know if we can but the the one that you sent me where it's like ricky krautman or something uh spoiler alert tanner morley did not commit to csu to be a kicker uh this dude had like disney world or, or epcot goes up to to morley just in a crowd first off tanner morley's walkman uh or lineman walk is like oh we, we need to, we need to grade his you're talking lineman about the walk. tiktok that was all my fyp <laughs> yeah sorry go his on. lineman walk is like a five star lineman walk yeah so it popped up on your fyp you sent it to me he's like you kick for csu and tanner's like what <laughs> It, yeah, I, no, I I remember. The, I was kind of <laughs> shocked. I was like, "Hey, yo, that that player looks really familiar." And I don't follow any high schoolers on my personal TikTok, and you're not gonna find it. Uh, sorry, just throwing that out there. I have a couple other TikToks uh, where I do Coach content, which is basically just for the podcast. But you know, I it popped up on my FYP, and I was like, "Yo, this is just another one of those, you know, like, hey, uh, what do you do for a living?" type of videos. Um, you know, just asking random people on the streets. And when I saw it was Tanner, like my mind exploded <laughs> for a minute and everyone in the comment section was like, Oh, Hey, yo, that's tub eats. That's tub eats. And I'm like, that's Tanner Morley from Valor Christian the CSU committee. <laughs> yeah. So right. for, for us, it was, <laughs> I was like, wait, what's Tanner Morley doing in this guy's TikTok? <laughs> Also, but you see, he he's famous. Y- y'all gotta find that video, uh, like listeners. Y'all gotta find this video because, oh my gosh, the comments, the uh, <laughs> the comments kill me. They're just, you know, um, uh, SZA has a song, so that's that's all I'm gonna say about the comments <laughs> that sent me. But you know, uh, you know, the I guy think asked our Gen him, Z audience knows what you're talking about. But go on, Cody. but. Uh, <laughs> You know, the guy asked him, hey, do you kick for CSU? And Tanner eventually says, nope, I'm going to play O-line there next year. And so I think that that is a a good transition here to talk about. You know, Tanner, he did have a few offers. You know, he had offer to New Mexico State, Unico. uh, Did not have an offer to Kansas State, but was on their radar, was, you know, an interest. Which I really think that that's kind of a miss by Kansas State. And by a lot of schools, look, Tanner Morley getting overlooked. I think that part of it is maybe people are like, oh, what am I, you know, is he, is he actually really good at two positions? And it's like, yeah, just watch the film. And it doesn't lie. He's a beast at, at both positions. And he's gone against some really good talent. He's been tested by D1 guys. He's been to, and you know, I talked about the one LV play, but he does, you know, have some plays where he does block brett alvey who i've called like the strongest player pound for pound in the state so i think that there's a lot of upside here for csu obviously you would prefer you'd prefer to to redshirt any incoming freshman but honestly if i'm the ram staff i have to feel good that you know when push comes to shove and if i have some injuries i could put tanner morley at essentially any position or, you know, I could shuffle around the other guys and plug Tanner Morley in there and find success. You know, some positions, obviously more than others, but you got to feel good about the all-around solid prospect that that you have coming in here if you're CSU. Yeah, no, you're absolutely getting a steal. And, uh, I mean, look, here's the thing with Tanner Morley. So last year he played with two D1 guys. I'm pretty sure the center went to drake or some fcs school like that and then you know the left tackle jake michaelo who happened to be our number one uh tackle on this list last year uh he went to stanford and so he kind of you know he kind of got lost in it a lot of people were paying attention to those two seniors and then morley here i mean he was a guard and you know when you have two d1 guys that you're playing in between life is pretty I mean, it's not super hard. It's pretty easy. But this year, I mean, we knew he had to step up, and he did. Not only did he meet expectations, but he exceeded those expectations. And uh, he committed to CSU, like, 
months, I felt like, before the season. He committed to them uh, pretty early on here just to get it over with. But honestly, if he did not do that and he kept his recruitment open, he would have a whole ton of power five offers uh i couldn't really imagine coach prime passing up on tanner morley you know uh if he wasn't already committed to csu i really couldn't uh imagine that and even i mean i don't know did tanner sign officially yet cody yeah I think he, he, did. Did, he did so he did the early yeah, so sign. he can't flip now but uh if he wasn't committed before I really couldn't have seen Coach Prime just passing him up. A lot of the Pac-12, I mean, all the Power Fives, I feel like would have been chasing Tanner Morley if he didn't commit before. But honestly, that's, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. You know, he didn't know if he was going to be healthy or have a great season. Like, there's just so many, like, variables that you really have to consider and whatnot before you commit but at the end of the day i mean still he always could have decommitted if he really wanted to and so he decided to stay loyal and choose csu and they're getting an absolute stud like you said um he could be a plug and play guy he most likely will redshirt and all of that great stuff but he is definitely a huge pickup for them who I mean, that's a program that really is in sore need of offensive linemen in general. And so for them to snag a Tanner Morley is is a steal. Because honestly, if Tanner Morley played tackle for one more year outside of this one, I think there would be a serious conversation. Um, I mean, it's already pretty serious, but I think there would be a pretty serious argument for him to be the number one offensive tackle in this on this list. Uh, period so there you go just throwing that out there you know he really only had that one year uh, which was a great one and whatnot but he had some really good years at guard too and so we'll see what happens I'm really excited for his future because I think he could really turn up and I mean contribute pretty pretty early on here which you don't always see with offensive linemen defensive linemen trench guys you know usually uh you know coaching staffs college coaching staffs like to let them marinate a little bit mature and get better uh because they're not really trying to find four-year starters at line because that's a lot of wear and tear right cody yeah no especially on on the next level but you know i definitely think that tanner morley i truly think he is a power five talent that ended up in the mountain west and so that stinks for opposing defenses but i mean really the, i feel like his his potential is even higher than we already have him listed and look we both have him listed at an 87 me with an 87.7 you had an 87.55 for an overall grade of 87.625 he's knocking on that four star door and a huge part of that is his versatility his intelligence and his adaptability here and I think that, you know, he proved, you know, like you said, he Jake Michaela was definitely the guy on that line last year. He was our number one tackle last year. And it was, well, what can Tanner Morley do? And, you know, he stepped up and, and he delivered. So, you know, that makes me very excited. And, uh, you know, I think that another thing about Tanner is, A, man, Tubbs Eat and NIL, that's got to, there's got to be something there. So, you know, I, oh, it's going to go crazy. Yeah, it's, <laughs> there's, there's definitely brought to you by in, in the future here. And we're, we're looking, I'm looking forward to having, uh, you know, uh, paid partnership or, uh, paid sponsored coming on my FYP from Tubbs Eats and, uh, you know, stuff like that. So, you know, congrats to the dude. Congrats to CSU that really just, I mean, this might be one of the one of the few great offensive linemen from the state that they get for a while. So uh, that's other news. But um, you know, huge huge congrats to both parties on what I think is going to be massively successful. And I think that there's a very very bright future ahead for Mister Morley here. And we're excited to uh, support him as well uh, in any way we can. But also, I'm just throwing this out there. I think, well, okay, maybe I can't throw this out there. You got to beat him first. But uh, if CSU ever beats CU, I'm definitely expecting him to eat a whole buffalo. Or, well, maybe not a whole <laughs> a buffalo. Bison burger. Because they're, like, endangered. <laughs> but, you know, you got to you gotta do something buffalo meat related. Pause. So, 
Yeah. Let's go ahead and uh, talk gotta about... Gotta beat him, though. You can't just be eating it and then get blown out by 50, which we'll see what happens, I guess. Uh, but, you know, you, you gotta you got do something like that. I think the fans would love it. I would I would watch it and repost it and like it. Follow Tub Eats and Tanner Morley on TikTok. Oh. Um, I guess you could follow him on Instagram, too. But we'll, we'll have all of them tagged. So, um, yeah, Cody, what do you think about that idea before I talk about our honorable mentions? You're doing a little too much. But how is no, that too? Not, you got not, no. That's not, that's applicable. Ideas, what do you mean? No, no, no. The idea is good. You know what I mean. But anyways, I think you're, it's applicable. You're killing me. I'm just saying you know the you fans. Did. You know what you did. But the fans are gonna demand it. <laughs> no, I definitely. So I'm just. There's gotta be I'm some kind of wager. Ahead. There's gotta be some kind of wager where you know if uh you know if if Morley's you know. Rams win, then then he eats like a buffalo burger or something. But if they lose, he has to eat like a lamb chop. I don't know or, or something like that. So uh, that well, I don't know if he's gonna agree to that. that. I, but, that'd be an interesting. But you know, hey NILs, uh, hire me for your marketing department because I think that there's uh, there's something interesting. There. But anyways, I definitely think that we could talk about honorable mentions. There were plenty. And, you know, yeah. actually, mind if I kind of open up with this one just just to get us started and then I'll let you kind of go go takeover mode. Yeah, go ahead. You got it. Yeah, I just want to say, look, the the I can already hear the groans. I can already see the comments. But here here's I, I'm going to give them their respect here. Look, Zach Henning and Wyatt Walters, the tackles at Grandview High School were they they were very very good prospects here look we have them both the pmc grade for both these guys is three star quality okay look and so you know zach henning he is you know by rivals rated as a three star guy i'm not sure if wyatt walters is but regardless both these guys are very talented they both do something similarly and some things uh they do a little bit different some things you know zach does well some things wyatt does better and you know at the end of the day, look, I got to see them and I talked a lot about them on, you know, the episode where I went to the Grandview versus Eagle Crest game where they really did dominate. And, you know, Grandview ran silly over this Raptors defense. And, you know, these guys looked super dominant. Look, Coach V was like, hey, watch the Creek film. And, you know, there are flashes of, you know, them holding their own against one of the best, well, actually the best, you know, edge rusher duo and the best defensive line unit in the state of Colorado. And so, you know, I do want to give them their respect here. I already know people will be like, Oh, you, you hate Grandview. You hate, no, we don't hate anybody here. All right. It's just, it's just how the grades fell out. And look, Grandview success is highly attributed to having two, three star D one guys on both ends here. That's, uh, on both ends of the line is what I'm trying to say here. There's no denying that. And so I just wanted to to float that out there and say, hey, look, that Eagle Crest game, they went brazy. That Creek game, one of the strongest tests any team can have. Obviously, you know, they they rose to the occasion and whatnot. And that they're both good prospects. They'll be fine. They're going D1. They are, you know, literally knocking at the door of, you know, six and seven of this list here, just on the outside looking in. And then, you know, another guy here that I want to talk about that, you know, I did the full set of grades for Ryan Thompson. I did get to see him live a couple of times, you know, in that playoff game. In that first, you know, half of that postseason game, he was very, very dominant, standing his ground against Erie and getting a lot of pancakes and feeling himself. So, you know, in, in the playoffs, he did, you know, do his thing and, you know, helped pro- helped be kind of that stalwart guy on the line for a very balanced offense. Coach V, I'm going to pass it to you to talk about these three guys and then some of our other guys that maybe we're not evaluating as an offensive lineman or, you know, guys that just narrowly missed the cut outside, outside of that. Yeah, uh, I'll talk about the Grandview boys first because they're they are literally just outside this list at six and seven, but Grandview honestly had one of the best offensive lines here, uh, probably next to Valor uh, in the entire state. You know, I truly believe Henning. Well, Henning's he's going to Washington, and Wyatt Walters, I believe he's been offered by Wyoming. I want to say, uh, but they had two D one guys. Uh, bookend at each tackle, 
which is rare. You don't see that every day, but, you know, they played Cherry Creek, and I was able to watch the majority of the game, not the whole game, because for some reason, NFHS did not, I don't know, it's like cut off, basically, for the majority of the first quarter, so I got to see the second, third, and fourth quarter, which anyways, is where I really feel like Grandview won this game, you know, finishing and whatnot, and so I watched the entirety of those drives, I watched every play, uh, replayed it a couple of times, too, um, just because I can't watch two guys at the same time, but I did my thing with that, and, you know, I, maybe it's a little bit unfair, but, you know, I think that one of the best ways to really evaluate is to see these linemen against top tier, uh, edge rushers and defensive linemen who are going to play on the next level, and Cherry Creek, I mean, you got Blake Purchase, who's the number one edge rusher, you got, Chase Brackney, who's the number two edge rusher in this class, by the way. Uh, you also have Hank Zalinskis up in there, who's a quality defensive tackle, among other guys that are rotated in. You know, and so they were going to get challenged, you know, regardless. And they didn't do horribly. Like, if they did horribly, they wouldn't have won this game at all. You know, so just throwing that out there. They played well enough. They won enough matchups and fights where... Grandview was able to win that game and honestly that's one of the biggest reasons why Grandview was able to upset Cherry Creek because they were able to somewhat neutralize that pass rush not completely but just enough to win it you know same reason why Valor was able to play Cherry Creek close it's because they have guys like Tanner Morley up front uh, you have the standout freshman Brett Koloje up front you know you got some guys on that Valor line who are extremely good at football just like these guys, but, you know, with that being said, we really nitpicked, and so, uh, talking about Zach Kenning, I mean, he was rated high, uh, at strength, uh, at pass protection, I mean, at strength, I gave him a 9.5, uh, straight up, because he was standing up Chase Brackney, who's one of the strongest dudes in the entire state, and then pass protection was an 8.7, like I said, he played really well against a Purchase and a Brackney, I think, well enough to you know be considered a four star type of talent at pass protection not five star because if he was five star he would have completely shut them down which he didn't you know so there you go but something that really hurt zach henning and like i said maybe it was just that specific game that i was just weighing a lot of my grading on uh did look at other games though but awareness really hurt him there were times where you know Cherry Creek, they're overloading that side, uh, Henning's side, and he just picked the wrong guy to hit. And now I'm gonna be real. I don't think that is him just consistently making the wrong decision because there were too many mistakes where he just consistently picked the wrong guy to block on a lot of those overload overloaded looks for him to, I don't know, for it to all be on him. I'm going to put a lot of it on the Grandview coaching staff because if I was a coach, you know, and I'm looking at Purchase, Brackney, and one other linebacker, whether it's Petridis or uh, Brantley on that side or or uh, Marte, or, well, he wasn't in that game, sorry. But one of those guys, I'm telling Zach Henning, hey, block Purchase, because Liam Zarka, our quarterback, can't outrun Blake Purchase, but he could potentially get away from some of these other guys. And you want to know who he didn't block a lot of the time, at least 80% of the time, on those overloaded looks? It was Blake Purchase, you know, and you can't do that. That's not great awareness, in my opinion. And honestly, maybe if Grandview had better coaching, um... I wouldn't have harshly graded him like that. Uh, and so it isn't even that bad. I still gave him a 7.8, but still not enough to be a three star. And so uh, that those are my reasonings there. I'm sure he's going to go to Washington. He's going to be a great tackle. He's going to be a great uh, pass, um, you know, protect guy. Uh, also didn't think he was the strongest run blocker, at least against them and, you know, some other guys as well, you know, Pine Creek and, um, 
how come I'm like totally blanking out? All the other 5A teams they played, you know, we saw Grandview play a number of times this year and last year. Saw them against Arapaho, uh, who had a lot of great pass rushers there. So there you go. And then Wyatt Walters, I mean, I think he's really underrated. I feel like he's a little bit more versatile than Henning. I actually have him a l little bit rated a little bit higher than Henning because of his versatility. I also think he's just naturally a little bit faster, more agile. Uh, they're not as strong, though, and not as good of a pass protector, but uh, definitely a little bit of a better run blocker. And so there you go. Just wanted to give my two cents on them. I really graded those two guys based on that game alone because that's the best competition they were going to play cherry creek and then obviously i looked at other games uh you know against other teams that they played who had uh top tier defensive linemen as well and i kind of still came to the same conclusion so boom ryan thompson also graded him he graded out to an 81.1 uh so there you go and then there's a number of guys here uh, Matt Green out of Arapaho, Caleb Grimble out of, um, uh, what is it, Smoky Hill, who I am pretty dead set on grading as defensive tackle, so be on the lookout for that uh, position list here, which should come out here in a couple of weeks. Um, still solid, you know, tackles and whatnot, but I think they're mostly going to play DT on the next level, and so we left them off the list because we don't allow athletes to make more than one of these uh per year so there you go uh, also looked at logan gilmore nathan geiger out of thunder ridge watched him a lot uh there was also Caden becker out of lineman sadly he doesn't have a lot of uh lineman film uh but it is what it is so there you go and those were just a few names to list here um the rest you could either look at interior linemen we labeled them as that or we looked at and we just felt like they didn't quite make the cut. But like I said, every year we've done this, there have always been D1 Power 5 guys who were on the outside looking in. And I think this year there's a lot of guys who are like group of 5 and FCS uh, type of players. But they are definitely like, I mean, they have power five potential. They're still playing on the D1 level, but they're just slightly overlooked. Is that fair to say, Cody? Yes. I mean, look, we already had like quite the back and forth as far as deciding, you know, Woodward or something. But, you know, when when given the chance to assess guys to be D tackles, I feel like it's a similar kind of draw where it's like, you know, there's going to be more guys that play D end or there's going to be, you know, whoever's big is going to be put on the offensive line more or less. And so it's similar where it's like everyone wants to catch touchdowns. So all these people play wide receiver when they could be evaluated as defensive backs, maybe should play more defensive back and whatnot. So I think that you could see that same kind of like offensive glamour compared to the defensive. I mean, it's a little different in the trenches because I feel like almost in, no matter where you are in the trenches, it's a little less glamorous, but you know, I, I feel like it's a similar kind of drop in that sense. And, you know, there's tons of guys here who really are very talented and maybe they are very talented, you know, as offensive linemen, but you know, with the, you know, where, where's the needs right on the next level. And so looking at them as interior defensive linemen or D tackles goes a longer way. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, uh, yeah, I mean, there you go, but that's just how the cookie crumbles sometimes. Regardless, this next player was someone who's going to make our list, uh, either way. And we've kind of known this for a while. He was probably going to be a top two or three guy and he definitely lived up to expectations this year. Cody, do you want to talk about our number one player here? Oh, you want me to, you want me to intro this guy? Or was I supposed to? I, I could do it. I could do it. All right, go ahead. It, <laughs> this player is, well, for me, the second highest rated player so far in PMC history. And he's also tied with Coach V, making him the second highest overall rated prospect in PMC history. And that is Rocky Mountain's very own Ethan Thomason, 
the BYU commit. Shout out to Sean Kidd, our guy who's now over at Mesa, who put us on to him pretty early. I remember one of the first times that we talked to Sean, he said, hey, man, there's a tackle at Rocky Mountain. Get eyes on him. He's, he's going to be big time. And that is true in both the literal in in the recruiting sense in the prospect sense but in the literal sense this six foot eight 325 pound mountain of a dude here look i give his size a 9.8 i feel like there's just there's not a lot to dislike about that size and you know this is the highest grade i think i've given anybody in a single category but and it's like you can't argue i mean you can look at it a little bit differently you know for sure but i feel like you know what more could you potentially want from size? And, you know, he, he's got that. But let's talk about the skill that he has at this size. I mean, he's just super athletic and, you know, somebody who, you know, has played multiple sports. And I think that is a part of it. But, you know, look at obviously 6'8", 325 pounds. You'd think that strength is an obvious thing here. But, I mean, it's the way that he overpowers people strength-wise. He's somebody who I have seen block four dudes on one play. Four dudes on one play. And, you know, whether that's literally driving one guy into two other guys, like it's a bowling ball and some pins, look, that's strength. I, you know, I don't care that, oh, he's so much bigger than them. No, 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 it's what, what is he doing? He's using... A defensive end as a battering ram to take out two linebackers. That is still impressive. I don't care because, you know, you add up those three guys and you start to get to, you know, where Ethan Thomason is weight-wise, probably even more weight, and he's still just mushing it around like it's a sled. You know what I mean? And, yeah, I'm going to, obviously, I think I'm just going to climb up here. I'm going to climb up from here. So, normally I start at the top, work my way down through the categories. We started from the bottom. And we're going to climb to the top just like Ethan did here. And so agility-wise, footwork-wise, he is a an absurd athlete. And, you know, from junior to senior year, he took massive strides in just maneuvering the field very, very well. 8.9 in agility, 8.9 in footwork. I think that he does a great job of driving his feet. He does a great job of maintaining. Look, he has great leverage, even at six foot eight. Where, like, you know, he really has to get down there to get under guys' pads. He does that very, very well. And he drives them. He has quick feet to combat the edge. And I think that he, you know, awareness-wise, climbing up this list a little bit more, this is another one of his 9.2 rated categories, is he has very knowledgeable eyes. And he recognizes blitzes before the play. He does pre-snap recognition. And he, you know, gets there better. And I would say that that is something that wasn't necessarily a strength for him in his junior year film that he definitely worked on. He has a very impressive kick step and it's very precise when he does have to use it. So that's talking about that footwork, but his awareness, look, I've seen him pick up cornerback blitzes. I've seen him pick up stunts correctly where, you know, he blocks, maybe that edge guy is running a stunt towards that guard. And so he, he gives him a good shove to that guard just in time to recognize that that tackle is coming out to him and then pancakes him as well. So he can dominate multiple players at a time at the point of attack. You know, not only is he recognizing that, but he's getting that quick snap off the line here. His reaction time for me is at a 9.2. He fires off the line very, very quickly. He gets his hands shot out of a cannon and, you know, at least gets, gets them up for that very first hit, that first push, that first contact. And, you know, when you're 6'8", 325, that first contact can go a very long way for you there. So, you know, I've seen him block two guys at once uh, in, in pass coverage or in pass protection, I mean. And, you know, his pass pro is rated out of nine here between his footwork, his reaction time, and, you know, just his dominance here. Look, nobody pushes Ethan Thomason, not in his film, not in this state. He stands his ground. And, you know, that awareness coming back around here too. Look, when you're this big, refs can see you pretty easily. They can't miss you is the better way to say it. And so it'd be really easy to probably bust him for, you know, holding a lot more often just because he does stick out. But he has that awareness of 
when to let it go, when to shove, when to push, when to pull, when to let their own momentum, like agility wise, he's good at letting defenders, because defenders will come in hell bent on getting him a push just off of momentum alone. And he'll just go, all right, I'll just let you take your momentum over to the sideline. Sure, that's fine. I'll let you drive yourself right into the turf, whatever. That makes my job easier. So he's very smart in that sense. In pass pro does a good job of doing that, reacts well to those different blitzes, those different looks. Run blocking wise, he's dominant. He does a good job of getting to the next level. And you know, who I this is so wrong to be laughing at this. But anytime I saw a player getting combo blocked by the guard and Thomason, I was like, why? Why? Like he seriously puts like one hand on on like the guy that he's comboing, and then he's like getting his other hand out to get to the next guy just with obviously his reach is absurd at six foot eight great wingspan great reach and that helps tremendously in his run blocking and he's smart too he does a good job use, utilizing that awareness in the run game in the pass game and looking for that next guy sliding off and you know blocking the correct dudes tons of the correct time now for his you know lower rated categories here I would say, you know, probably his biggest weaknesses here is his hand fighting and his versatility. I just think that, you know, he could get a little bit more of a bag when it comes to, to hand fighting, but he just really hasn't been tested that way. And, you know, when you dominate in so many other areas and so many other facets, it's maybe not, well, maybe it's not that, you know, his hand fighting needs improvement so much as maybe it hasn't been proven to me as much. That, you know, he, you know, he didn't go up against a, a Blake purchase, which I think does a lot for looking at hand fighting and assessing it in the most proper way possible. Or, you know, guys that had a super big bag and if they did, it didn't really matter because of all the other things that he was good at. And then versatility wise, I mean, you know, he played agility wise. I would trust him to play guard, but I wouldn't put him there. I just wouldn't do it. I, I don't think that makes a lot of sense. I think that he is very well equipped to be a tackle. And while he does play both tackle spots, he does play left tackle by far the most. You look at snap count, it's probably like close to 90% of the time. If if not that, then probably 80%, 80 to 90% of the time he's doing that. And so, you know, it's not that he is a versatile. I just, it's one of those things where it's like, why would you? Why would you? <laughs> What's the point of of sliding him inside when he's so dominant as a tackle? And tackle is a very hard position to play, and you have somebody that is absurdly sized for it, absurdly, absurdly athletic for it, and you have a pretty incomprehensible prospect here with just a lot of green lights here. Go, 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 all gas, no brakes, making for my overall grade of an 89.1. Like I said, that is the second highest grade and only 0.1 behind Blake purchase, which, you know, leads me to believe that Ethan Thomason should be viewed more as a four-star guy, but coach V you talk about your overall grade and your prospect evaluation of Ethan Thomason, and maybe even react a little bit to what I had to say. Yeah, no, for sure. So, uh, well, let's, let's just hop to the grades here. I, let me just start there. So versatility gave him an 8.5. Hand fighting 8.6, pass protection 9, run blocking is an 8.25, but then I gave him his reaction time awareness and footwork all 9s, uh, agility 8.8, .8, strength 9.2, and size gave him a 9.5 here, uh, and I'll explain that right now actually, so talking about his highest grades, size 9.5, uh, strength 9.2, uh, the reason this is probably not a 10, is because uh, he probably could be a little bit heavier. I mean, he's 6'8", so proportionally speaking, he could probably be, I mean, coming out of high school, maybe, I guess, 350 or so. I know it's a little overkill, but there are tackles that are that much. I think to play at a good, consistent level, though, it's better for him to be leaned up around 325, probably 330, just to be safe. And so that's, I'm kind of nitpicking here. So just, there you go. Um, Same. I don't know if I'll ever give a player a 10 at any skill position coming out of high school. Uh, so, yeah. Now, strength, 9.2. This is a strong dude. Uh, 
I did not get to see him play live. I have seen him uh, play online, like do streams and stuff. Um, but did go to a combine. Shout out Prep Red Zone uh, and our guy Ryan Wesley over there. And then shout out Matt McChesney once again in 6-0. He came and worked out with the offensive lineman. And that's actually where I got to see my best look at Thomason here. Uh, because he moved really, really well. Ah, oh, God. And he did really well in the one-on-ones and all the drills. I was extremely impressed by him. Him and Lincoln Fowl Pally out of Fountain Fort Carson were the guys who really stood out. And Lincoln is someone who will probably be top three on this list next year, assuming he continues to play tackle. So, there you go. Um, yeah, but that's where I really got to see him. And so, strength off the charts. It shows he is not going to be overpowered. On the high school level. I just don't see it. Even if he was to go up against a Brackney. Or a Purchase. I just don't really see them. Being able to overpower him. Like that. At least significantly. So there you go. Uh, now other stuff I want to talk about. Footwork awareness. Reaction time. Uh, pass protection. All nines. I mean he is a neutralizer. At left tackle. A very good pass blocker. Any pass rushers that come up against him, I mean, I really haven't seen many reps or honestly any reps at all where he lost. And I did look at a little bit of those Arapaho uh, or of that Arapaho game from last year. And he really, I mean, he did his thing. You know, it was kind of a quieter day for those pass rushers last year, if I remember correctly. Uh, well, at least Thomason did his thing. I don't know about the rest of the line. So there you go there. So yeah, I mean, he's as reliable as they come. Uh, he is, in my eyes, a four-star guy. Actually, I have him rated at an 8.85. For me, that is the highest rated prospect that we've ever that I've ever graded personally because I believe Purchase was an 88.1, so just slightly below him. But both guys, who I believe, are worth the like a four star rating to be truthful with you now uh things that are a little bit lower here well i'm just going to talk about his lowest grades because you really talked about a lot of his other stuff here cody but run blocking is an 8.25 for me uh, look he's athletic enough to get to the next level and win those matchups i just didn't really see him get to the next level a ton i think there are a lot of times where he was just really like, he was kind of settling a little bit with just sealing the guy off instead of finishing the block and then moving on to the next level. Uh, so there's just a lot of that when it came to combo blocking. Didn't really see him pull at all, I want to say. Um, at least his senior year, didn't really get to see him pull at all. So that might be an issue. And so I think moving on to the next level, i just like to see him really work on that run blocking, get more aggressive, really just clear those lanes. You know, because he's an excellent pass uh, protector. But as a run blocker, I think uh, he could use a little bit more work there. And he has the athletic tools to truly be dominant there, in my opinion. But uh, altogether, Ethan Thomason is a monster of a man, a giant of a man. Super athletic. This is a kid that could dunk as well, in case you didn't know. He plays hoops. Uh, not this year. Uh, well, this school year, obviously, but he has in the past. And, I mean, he's big time. He's one of the best athletes in the entire state. For someone this big to move uh, at the speed that he does is, is incredible. You know, I've got to see him watch... Uh, or I watched him run his 40 time live multiple times and, you know, go through a bunch of combine drills and stuff, testing his athleticism. And I mean, he surpassed it for a guy that massive and for him to carry that weight really well, uh, just went a long way. And honestly, you know, this is a guy who probably should have been a four star, but, you know, it is what it is. And so, Cody, I'm just going to go ahead and hop into it here. So. Ethan Thomason is committed to BYU. Uh, and on top of that, he's actually has already left for his mission, which is in Missouri, I want to say, for two years. So I don't know if he's even going to be able to see this. I'm sure his family will probably be able to see this, but I don't know if he will be able to see this slash hear this. Uh, so, you know, it is what it is there. But he's doing his thing there. You know, um, he is uh, part of the Church of the Latter-day Saints. And so, gotta respect that and his religion. But, you know, this was a kid who was offered by pretty much 
every Power 5 school, or it seemed like every Power 5 school uh, in the country, I think, actually, just looking at his offers, he got an offer from every Power 5 conference. Uh, just going down the line, he was offered by Tennessee, so that's the SEC. He was offered by Nebraska, Michigan State, that is the Big Ten. He was offered by Oklahoma State, that's the Big 12. Then you have, obviously, Stanford, CU, Utah, Cal. Uh, that's the entire Pac-12. Actually, never mind. I don't think he was offered by the ACC. But I could have sworn there was a Florida school on that list. Whatever. Still, though, he was a big-time prospect. Uh, I mean, this was a guy that was heavily recruited. And ultimately, he chose BYU. And so... Well, that being said, Cody, uh, he is on his mission for two years, so he won't be able to play football for two years. But when he comes back, he'll be attending BYU. He's already signed with them and all that stuff, and so, you know, that's ongoing. But he will be back in two years' time, so 2025, because he did leave for his mission a couple days, weeks ago. And so, Cody, what do you think about Ethan Thomason's outlook here? Slash, what do you think about my evaluation of him? Um... That being that he's a big time, pro a huge prospect who's an excellent athlete and an excellent pass protector. Well, seeing as how I uh, I forgot to update this, I think he is our highest rated prospect in PMC history, sitting at an 88.975. So kudos to that. And I think it's deserved. I think that. Uh, your grading of him and my grading of him. Oh, look, we're only separated by uh, math time. Uh, 0.25. Yeah, 0.25 of of assessment. So obviously, we both agree that he's a generational talent out of Colorado at this tackle spot. And you know, I think that BYU. I mean, you could just look at the list of prospects here. And all these offers, you know, a &M, OSU, OU, as an OU fan, uh, a little sad there, Washington State, Virginia, Vanderbilt, you know, you look at all of these teams here, BYU has to be feeling like they have the winning lottery ticket here. Uh, obviously, you know, they have probably some of the things off the field that he's looking for a little bit more. And, uh, you know, I think that, you know, they are fine with, with waiting two years. You know, obviously, philosophically, they're they're in they're aligned in that way but you know they are definitely more than fine that uh they do get one of the best prospects well the best prospect in colorado according to pmc and one of the best prospects in the nation you know he's ranked number 65 at offensive tackle and i think that that's even being modest here honestly so i think that you know byu has got to be stoked obviously ethan He's, he's about that, and, uh, you know, I think that his interests align very, very well with what BYU has to offer, you know, as as far as what they have going on, you know, in their halls and whatnot. So, you know, I think that – I think it's a good fit. I think it's a good fit, and, yeah, it's BYU 100%, and we the, – the only, the only part as a football fan that makes me antsy is we got to wait. We got to wait. But, you know um, – We've we've had to wait for for prospects to get their time before, and um, you know as as long as he he stays he stays on it, you know at, at least physically, and you know keeps that that build going for him, which I think he will, and I think he's done a good job of working towards that build. That uh, yeah, there's there's going to be a beast at uh, Brigham Young, so yeah, no, for sure. Uh, I mean, we were, we're going to probably have to wait for all of these linemen to play anyways. So, there you go there. Uh, it's just a little bit more time, but if anybody knows how to handle that situation, that's BYU. And, I mean, it's not like they're a bad school either. I mean, that's a school that is in talks with joining a Power 5 program, if I'm not mistaken. I feel like they are always in talks. And so, who knows? You know, maybe he'll be playing in the Big 12 or Pac-12 or whatever it's called when the time comes. But for now, you know, we obviously wish him all the best. Uh, look, he is very well deserving of this grade. He is an athletic freak. Uh, you got prospects who are highly skilled. You know, a lot of credit to them. Uh, you got prospects who are athletic freaks. 
And then you got guys who are the perfect blend of both. And that's really what Ethan Thomason is. I mean, just the technique. I mean, he's not really raw there uh, and whatnot. I mean, he's pretty sound. And, you know, for him at 6'8", 325 pounds to be doing what he does is honestly elite. And, you know, I, I am going to criticize just a little bit. Uh, he is a little bit too tall to be kicked inside or out. He almost really has to play tackle and just by comparison i mean guys who are six seven six eight if you go down if you look it up you know and just look at the nfl and whatnot uh because i think that's the best way to look at this there aren't really anybody on the offensive side of the football uh who are six seven six eight that don't play either tight end or offensive tackle that's just kind of what you have to do i think the only other uh i think there's only one guy who really, you know, gets kicked inside, and that's Andres Pete, the New Orleans Saints tackle slash guard, but he was drafted as a tackle, though, and so all the other guys who are 6'7", 6'8", 6'9", whatever, you, they're for sure tackles, and so that does kind of limit just a little bit his versatility, uh, but that's okay. You know, he does it at a very high level. He's a great player. I mean, for someone to be that tall and uh, big is is special, you know, and you just don't see that really. I mean, we're talking NFL talent that we are comparing him to uh, because that gives us the most accurate representation of where he really is at uh, coming out of high school right now. Right, Cody? Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, I think you, you word it. You worded it more eloquently uh, that, you know, he is just a little too tall to <laughs> to try and squeeze inside here. And uh, yeah, from and obviously from a prospect standpoint, why would, you know, I feel like finding a tackle like Ethan Thomason is crazy. So keep repping him at tackle for for that future. Yeah, no, for sure. And plus, you want a guy who has really good reach as well. I mean, you look at. Guys like Jordan Mailata, who's 6'8", Taylor Luan, who's up there. I mean, they, they have really long reaches, and that works to their advantage. And so you rather have those guys go up against your edge rushers than, like, you know, defensive tackles who are 6'1". So you know what I mean by that. So there you go. But, uh, yeah, just to review, though, our top five class of 23 offensive tackles here in the state of Colorado is at number five, Noah Authorton out of Longmont, out of Longmont, uh, the South Dakota State commit. At number four, we have Evergreen's Russ Woodward, uh, the Army commit. At number three, we have Jack Rons out of Dakota Ridge. Not committed anywhere yet, but offered by Valpo. Offer uh, him now right now yeah definitely somebody who's gonna shoot up some boards here and then at number two we have valor christians tanner morley tubbeats the csu commit and then at number one we got the rocky mountain byu commit ethan thomason um an absolute beast so boom there you go <sighs> all right that's another one basically here in the books like we've been saying offensive line is always hard to gauge um look colorado puts out some great offensive linemen those are arguably the best prospects year in year out that we put out uh for you know we know why you know we said it at the beginning and here at the end a uh, shout out mcchesney he does a lot for the offensive line talent here um you know it's not just due to our big you know, because there's a bunch of dudes who are big and athletic. It's dudes who are big, athletic, and skilled. That's what matters. That's the product that Colorado consistently puts in, uh, or sorry, puts out year in, year out. So there you go. Right, Cody? Is there anything else you want to add on here before I close this thing up here? No, I, I agree with that. I, You know, it's fun watching these guys go D1. You know, it's always good, Colorado. You know, putting our, our names in the hat there and getting some respect that way via these these dogs here. And, I mean, geez, Ethan Thomason really plays for a school called Rocky Mountain when he's like a whole mountain himself, bro. Like, that's just, 
Ethan Front Range Thomason, man. That's that's what they got to be calling him once he once he gets out there to BYU. But you go ahead and wrap it up. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, but there you go. For the third straight year, five, or I'm pretty sure it's the third straight year, we got five D1 guys, D1 level guys here. And so with that being said, thank you for rocking with us for this episode. Go ahead and check us out and show us some love on social media at Playmakers Corner. That's Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Uh, and then go ahead and follow us on TikTok as well, as well where you will be able to hear uh, clips of our breakdowns and whatnot, along with some of the highlights of a lot of these great players. And if we can find them on TikTok, they are tagged as well so that you could follow them. Uh, and then also follow them on social media. They should be tagged on Instagram and Twitter. But make sure you show us love there. And then uh, go ahead and subscribe to us on YouTube and Twitch. These episodes are being shown there as well. And I know we have listeners on those. So thank you so much. Go ahead and give us a like or comment what you think as well. Um, on Twitch, we will be doing some more live film breakdowns once we're done with these top five seniors list. Uh, so go ahead and follow us, subscribe to us there. We'll be doing a lot of women's flag football stuff through Twitch. So just keep that in mind because that season is coming here uh, pretty quickly. I believe they start in March. So there you go. And uh, what am I forgetting? I'm pretty sure. All these players, once again, just to reiterate, are invited onto the show. Yes, we'd love to have you on, uh, talk with you about what you're doing, how high school was, what you think about our evaluation, what you're looking forward to, all that great stuff. You know, we've uh, interviewed a lot of great football players. That goes for all of you, our guys that make these top five lists. Hit us up and we'll set up the time just like that. So there you go. But thank you so much for rocking with us. Make sure to, oh, make sure to give us a good rating on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Leave us a good review. We really appreciate those. But with that being said, I have been one of your co-hosts, Simon Voyanos, a.k.a. Coach V. And I've been your other co-host, Cody Stoffer. Peace. And let these big boys eat. We'll see you later.